So I'll start off um, and say a few words. So my name's Richard Tilly. I'm the director of the Electron Microscope Unit here at UNSW. Okay, so, um, so I guess just to start, um, to kick us off, you know, in situ TM is really kind of challenging, right? It is really hard. You've got to get kind of the TM all working, cameras all working, holders all working for your experiments. Um, so it is really challenging. So I wanted to ask what type of questions are all of you interested in for in situ TM? You're coming here to a masterclass. What are the types of things you would like to see in an in situ TM? Yeah. Electrocatalysis. Electrocatalysis. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've done quite a bit on electrocatalysis. And um, I think there's still a lot of progress that can be made, but that's a, a big one for us as well. And I think there's a lot of developments can be made over the years that will get better and better, but definitely electrocatalysis. I mean, Ingemar and I often kind of think about talking about active sites and actually seeing the active sites during catalysis. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. Anything else? Just an Yeah, it's a matter of uh, in making a high risk, high aid for quality in what they can do with the yeah, yeah. So that's a great one. So um kind of thinking about how things change, particularly with stimuli. And then so you were mentioning heating and then how things can, can change or transform or, or precipitate during heating. Yeah. So that's the key one. Any any other comments? Uh, so, like running early devices with each microscope and seeing how my device or the device changes the morphology. Thanks to the degradation. Yeah, absolutely. So um, actually running devices and seeing how they change and degrade, as you say, I think that's kind of a key one. And, you know, at UNSW, we're, we have a lot of um, solar cell background. Um, so that's a big one for us. Um, but I think also batteries and those kind of devices, particularly how they change under biosing. Um, but again, I think we've got good technologies, but they will improve for, for those kind of uh, things in the future. Any last ones? Yeah. Just uh, gas catalysis, just, uh, and what's the uh, gas cells, low cells, what's the uh, ultimate resolution to this? And uh, if we can aim like nanometer resolution uh, or something, <laughs> you can see what catalysis inside the gas cell. Yeah, yeah. So that's something that hopefully you'll see a bit more of over the kind of the next couple of days. Um, but I think seeing how these transform under, say, gases and heating is really critical. Um, and again, I think the technologies are just going to improve and improve and improve. It's such an exciting topic because I do feel we're at the very beginning of it, quite honestly. Um, and in 20, 30 years time, it's exciting to think about where we will go. Um, so anyway, these were some of the things that I was thinking about. So um, so thinking about particularly transformations, and I'm a chemist by background, so particularly um, mechanisms, if you're making something, how do you, you start with something A and how you do transform it to something B? Um, but that's a little bit similar in some ways to kind of the changes you might see under some of the, the stimuli. So um, you might be heating something or exposing it to say heat and a gas and how things change. Um, I think there's also been a lot of beautiful work looking at um, kind of nanoscale properties and particularly Dimitri's been pioneering a lot of these work, how you take a nano wire and if you bend it, what are the, the mechanical properties of that wire, but also how it breaks, how it fractures on what are the, the defect lines that it actually breaks. Um, and the other thing that uh, I think we're kind of interested in um, is kind of like these metastable states. What are these states you can actually capture you might look at a, a, you know, this is, say, for example, one of our catalysts that we make in my group. Um, so these are, we, we specialize in making all these beautiful shaped um, nanoparticles. So these are some um, hourglass shaped particles made of ruthenium. And these are excellent catalysts for the oxygen evolution reaction. Um, but you start off with these metal nanoparticles, but actually the active site for oxygen evolution reaction. And that's one of the critical reactions for when you're doing kind of the water splitting for the for taking water and then converting it into oxygen and hydrogen. Um, 
But the active site during this reaction is, is actually ruthenium-4+, plus, ruthenium-5+. Plus. So actually the active site is an iron. Um, so we start off with all these beautiful metal particles, but, but we're not actually imaging the active site. So I think this is ultimately uh, where we would like to get to um, over time, actually imaging, say, catalysts and seeing what they do during the reaction. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit um, about this kind of paper and the in situ TM done in this paper. Um, so this was a paper that we published last year, and um, this was really looking at making um, some single atom catalysts. So single atom catalysts are the, the kind of the hot topic in, in catalysis at the moment. So for inorganic catalysts, where you just have the one atom doing, doing the activity, um, the, the kind of the joint first authors on this paper was Agus and Lucy. Um, so Agus is now um, working at the same center that, that John's at in the States, in one of the national labs in the States. Um, as you can see, we're a big kind of high five team in the group. So we try and get lots of energy with the high five. So, um, so, so Lucy and Agus were the ones that led this, this work. Um, so this, these are looking at catalysts for um, the methanol oxidation reaction. Um, so this is a reaction where you start off with um, methanol, and then you oxidize it up to get CO2 and H2O. So it's for the fuel cell where you use methanol as the fuel. And it's quite, a, if you have methanol fuel cells, they're quite high energy fuel cells. So that they're useful if you want to have a, um, a fuel cell, which will give you quite a lot of power and energy. So in terms of single atom catalysts, um, most of the work making single atom catalysts has been done on two-dimensional materials on 2D supports. So as electron microscopists, we can all understand why. If you have a, a 2D material, such as graphene, then it has very, very low contrast in the electron microscope. And then if you put, say, a platinum atom on top, it's really going to ping out and, and you're really going to see it in dark field. So most of the work on single atom catalysts has been done on these two-dimensional materials, and Ingemar will talk about that as well. Um, but what we were particularly interested in and what we've, we've done a lot in my group is looking at um, catalysts where you have two metals, um, so metal on metal catalysts. And particularly for the methanol oxidation reaction, the most active material is um, platinum ruthenium. So when we were doing our synthesis, when we were making our materials, we start off with these um, branch ruthenium materials. So these are a branch ruthenium structure. And you can see you have these kind of branches, so relatively thin. And then you have all this faceting along the edge. So the nice kind of crystalline structures that you can start with. And then with our chemistry, we then decorate these branch ruthenium supports with little islands or little clusters of platinum. So all of these little kind of nodules or nodes sticking up here, all of these are little platinum um, islands. So we can decorate with these platinum islands are all about one to two nanometers in size. So they're little islands, which might be about say five to, to 10 atoms across. So what we found was when we had these, these islands on our ruthenium support, we heated them, we annealed them in some hydrogen gas. And what we found was actually all of the platinum spread across the surface of the ruthenium. So I think for, for me, for us, this was all very kind of a little bit counterintuitive. Normally, if I think about a, a flat substrate and I have an island on the substrate and I anneal it and heat it, I would think that the islands might come together and sinter. That's what you would naturally expect, the islands to join together, to form bigger clusters and minimize your, your surface energy of your islands. So we're interested that basically when we anneal these, we can see kind of before we have this nice EDS mapping. Um, so this was done on our F200 and you can pick out all the platinum islands in orange and then you've got your ruthenium support. Then you have all your ruthenium spread across 
across these particles. Um, so we were really kind of interested in this process. So um, John, we've worked together for a long time. Uh, so John um, did his PhD with me quite a while ago um, when we were back in New Zealand. So we, we worked closely together for a long period of time. So I knew that John had a, um, an excellent setup in his lab, so with his ETEM, but also he had one of these K3 IS cameras um, to, to really take these beautiful videos. So this was actually done in collaboration. So um, there's John, who you'll see later a lot, but this was also done in collaboration with Ben Miller from Gatan. So um, Ben is one of the authors on the paper as well, who really helped with the data processing. So this is a video where we're watching kind of these islands kind of transform and change and thinking about the kind of the process of how they turn from these islands on the surface to these single atom catalysts. So this is um, so this transformation when we were doing it in the lab. Um, this is under heating and hydrogen gas. So it's a gas holder and heating. So we were doing this in our lab at 200 degrees, but John will explain to you all of the considerations that he had to come up with. Um, so he could design that these experiments could be done practically in a, in a TEM. So actually these experiments were done in the TEM at 600 degrees. So it shows how stable these holders really are in the system. Um, so I'll just show this. The good thing about in situ TMs, you're going to see a lot of videos. <laughs> so, uh, let's try and show this one again. So we start off with these islands on the surface, and then um, then as we're doing our heating, we can see our islands get smaller and smaller and smaller, and kind of disappear. So, um, no, this this video is is so, is. Sorry, yeah. Richard, it's a silly question, I think. No. Because you're in the environmental TM, do you need a special holder for this? Yeah, John. Uh, John will discuss kind of how we set up the experiments. So it's basically open to the atmosphere. To, to, of... to, to give you to brief briefly answer, basically the ETAM uh, can't. Uh, it does lower pressures than you can do in the in the gas holders. But there are advantages of doing these experiments in an ETM compared to a uh, conventional corrected TM as well. So e this is a, in an ETM, which is um, a kind of TM corrected ETM. Um, but yeah, John will, John will talk about all of how he, he really designed these experiments. Um, so if we, if we have a look, we start off, so this is some stills from the video. So we start off with our, and then as the video is progressing, we can see the island getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is kind of our cartoon of what's happening. But essentially, our pattern myelin is kind of spreading across the surface, which I said is kind of like counterintuitive to what we would expect. And then we're ending up as this, this is kind of finished this process with our atoms all spread across the surface. Um, and it's not showing up too well, but but this really is beautiful. It's got beautiful atomic resolution TEM during all this process. So this is in a gas at 600 degrees. Um, it's not doing justice to the, the images that we get, but you can see that you have all the, the layers of ruthenium atoms. You can see the platinum atoms are going directly off them. And then as we in the other, we've got um, the Fourier transform of the island and the support. And then over time, you can see that kind of the, 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 the dots converge as the platinum is, is spreading across the surface. Um, so this really is kind of state of the art in terms of what you can get with um, in situ TM. Um, uh, OK, so just to wrap up um, for this um, particular project, uh, we also did a lot of kind of nice um, TM in terms of looking at the sample in kind of our grand arm. So um, 
this is some of the kind of the single atom uh, characterization. So particularly we could do kind of the dark field imaging, get the brighter spots on the platinum atom. But one of the nice things about the, the Grand Arm too is the EDS capability. So we could do EDS and really pick out that the, the platinum atoms were kind of located at these precise atomic um, spots and locations. Um, and all of this led, led to kind of a very nice catalyst, um, which ultimately is why it was published in Nature Catalysis. Um, but the big, the big problem for these catalysts, they're fantastic catalysts, but the big problem for platinum catalysts for methanol oxidation is that when you're converting your methanol to water and CO2, you always go through um, a pathway where you're forming carbon monoxide. And when you have your platinum catalyst, the carbon monoxide basically will poison the surface. So your platinum catalyst stops working. Um, so what got us excited about these catalysts when we did the electrocatalysis is essentially when you're doing your methanol oxidation, you get your forward peak. And then as your methanol is being oxidized, you get lots of CO forming, that poisons the surface, your catalyst stops working. And then when you do the reverse peak, you get this peak in the backward scan, and that's oxidizing off your CO and then cleaning your surface again. Um, but what got us excited about these single atom catalysts was we were getting the, the forward peak to do the methanol oxidation, but we essentially weren't seeing this backward peak. And that started giving us the clues that maybe these were actually catalysts that weren't getting um, poisoned by CO. Um, so then we, we, we had very nice kind of stable um, catalysts for, for methanol oxidation. Um, and then we, we did some modeling to, to kind of confirm that. So I'll just mention this briefly, just to, to say that Microsoft Australia is funded through NCRIS and that's a national research infrastructure scheme. So actually NCRIS funds lots of different organizations across Australia. So one of them is the National Computational Infrastructure. So just as we, we run microscopes that are available for people across the country, um, I gave Sean Paul, who's a friend of mine, and said, hey, we've got some hot catalysts. Can you do some modeling for us? Um, so Sean and his team did this beautiful modeling. And essentially, the single atom catalysts, from their modeling, we can find out that the, the carbon monoxide, and the CO, essentially binds a lot more weakly to your, um, your single atom catalyst, and this is why they don't get poisoned. OK. Um, so Shan sensibly only gave me half an hour for talking. <laughs> I do have lots of other things I could talk about. Um, so we did. We have done quite a lot of in situ TM over the years. Um, this paper was looking at how gold particles coalesce and join together. Um, and because again, you're making videos, you can get things like lots of kinetics. Um, this is showing kind of all the kinetics and how you expect two particles to join together over time. Um, but the last thing I'll, I'll finish off on is just some kind of conclusions or thoughts. So as I said, I think that um, I'm sure you're going to have a fantastic couple of days. I think that in situ TM, as I said, I, I really feel it's almost at, at the beginning. Um, I think that in the next 10, 20, 30 years, there's going to be a lot more and more developments. Um, and particularly, I would love to see the excited states of these catalysts when they're actually doing their reactions. These are things in the future. Um, I'm sure people would love to see biological me mechanisms. Imagine if you could watch a um, in situ atomic resolution of, let's say, a T cell coming and killing a cancer cell. Right? All of those things would be fantastic to, to, to be able to see. So there are lots of stuff we'll be wanting to do in the, in the, in the future. Lots and lots of questions that we could answer. Um, so this is all driven by lots of development from lots of companies. So with the in-situ masterclass, we didn't particularly, there's quite a few different companies that make holders. We didn't particularly want to favor or get sponsorship from any of the holder companies. We have a couple of different holders, companies, uh, holders at UNSW, and there's a few around the country. Obviously, we need developments in cameras, and I'm sure that Gatan is uh, working on those. And there's um, kind of lots of elements in hardware and the microscopes themselves. But also, 
the software and how you actually process all these videos. So some of those topics we'll try and touch on because these videos are huge. Okay. Um, so we'll touch on how you can actually process some of these videos as well. Okay, thanks a lot for your time. Um, I think that's me finished. Um, as I know, the online participants will miss out the lab. So here I invite two panels um, where you will hear their presentations today and tomorrow to join me. So we want to use this opportunity to yes. invite them to share with you um, all the behind the scenes tips and tricks, because you're going to hear all the wonderful, I think Richard already made a, a, a presentation about all the wonderful results you can get, information you can learn from in situ TEM. But um, the preparation to get the in situ TM working with a reliable result is quite challenging. So while you can't join the lab, and then so um, I have Chow from U uh, QUT here, and also John Watt. He's going to let me turn the cameras. Right here. Hi. Yes, you just get a, a little taste of uh, what John can do in his ETM. So I asked them to join us to share. Um, their experience and how you can get your uh, in-situ um, experiment started in your institute if you have um, a folder and all the things that you need to pay attention to to get it working. So I'll get it. So maybe um, if you have any questions, please uh, interrupt and then type all type it in the chat. So um, now it's about 10.08. So we'll end to finish around 10.20. So you have time to have a break before all the presentations start. So I um, just want to introduce here, he is Chow, you're going to see him again for tomorrow's talk. Yes, and then John will be talking yeah. today and also tomorrow with a lot of exciting results. Hi everyone. So um, yeah, I guess the idea to think about as you listen to these talks is that uh, there's a lot of difference between standard TM and, and situ TM in terms of conditions and that your what you see ex situ might not necessarily be what you see inside the TEM. Uh, certainly within the ETM, we have uh, different uh, levels of gas pressure that we can introduce, but then even within liquid cell and gas cell, um, your volumes change, uh, all of your surface area changes. Um, you also have the electron beam, which is of course highly reducing, uh, which can affect different uh, reactions. Um, so I think just moving forward, listening to the talks, it's understanding that, yeah, what we see ex situ might, ne might not necessarily be what we see in situ, um, and it can take quite a bit of preparation and, um, yeah, changing the conditions to get things to work. That's probably my intro spiel. Okay. Yeah. So I think jo Chow here, he's a mode, particularly optical, so maybe you can have uh, some brief in uh starting point but you want to go into more niche or more maybe custom uh made uh mm. design of in situ how do you go about that um so mostly i've been working on uh, probing holders uh including stm holder uh that can do some electrical biasing onto the materials uh, you can also introduce geo heating to the material and um the other type of probing is the uh, afm probing so you will have uh, uh, a probe and a cantilever, and you can uh, make some uh, force like tensile test uh, to the materials. So uh, both are uh, probing holders. And um, my special um, uh, focus is some optical holder that uh, uh, we have the probe um, from the STM holder as well as uh, optical fiber which is also emulating onto the sample. So um, that was my adaption. Uh, at that time, optical holder from Nano Factory was uh, on, only optical. Then I added a probe to, to suit my interest because my interest is on um, optical electronics. So I did some adaptations. Nowadays, there are some uh, small companies. They start to make some customizable holders. Um, and there are some holders with uh, a few electrodes um, provided, for example, six contacts or four contacts that you can design some kind of chips to place those chips onto the holder to suit your application. So I'd say, as Sherry asked, if you want to 
make some special thing. Um, first, um, you will find a base, like a holder base. For example, if you want six electrodes, you buy a six electro electrode holder. And then the second thing is you design experiment, including how the chip should be designed to make contact with the electrodes. And second is how you place your sample onto that chip. And if you want liquid, you need to design, uh, for example, two layered structure, like you have a base chip and a top chip and then you try to seal it and um, and inject, uh, inject some liquid in it and seal it. For example, this is why it's so, so a lot of design in heat can be yeah. there. Yeah, it's just a lot of uh, quite challenging and they need a lot of thinking in the design process to get to work with. So maybe, okay, I'm going to grab John quickly. So I think I maybe I don't see any questions. So I will maybe ask on behalf for both of you to answer. Mm -hmm. So I think depending on different type of holder, different stimuli you need. And the first thing is to get your, um, so you can interpret in your case, nanoparticles on two suitable substrate. In your case, the right contact, so you're measuring the right thing. So I want to ask more in terms of some preparations. I, um, we hear a lot of questions. What kind of substrate should I use? What should I pay attention to? What is a good choice? Can you give us some experience and tips? Uh, well, um, I guess that's one of the advantages of an ETEM is you can use whichever holder you like, which I'll go into. But for most of the other institutes, including the heating holders, um, it's proprietary chips. So, um, you know, there's silicon nitride windows, carbon windows, and vacuum. So that really depends on what you're trying to image. Uh, the silicon, take for instance, the prototypes, the silicon nitride uh, windows um, are about are about 40 nanometers thick. And so you can't really see anything. Um, whereas the carbon are about 18 nanometers thick. And so you can see atoms if you have good, uh, good alignments. Um, and then, of course, vacuum is the best, but you have to have something large enough that's um, going over the vacuum. And so, you know, these things, they actually just increase the price from $1,000 US for a packet of 10 to $1,500 US for a packet of 10, which was shocking to me. So we um, need a lot of money to do in features. <laughs> well, yeah. But you, some hacks. Yeah, you also need to make sure that you're, um, you know, testing things ex situ. So looking at your deposition. Um, on normal copper grids to make sure that you have the right concentration um, before you move to a chip. Um, and so there is a lot of like preparation in terms of making sure that everything's looking good before you actually set up um, and commit to a you know, $150 chip for institute. Do you do preparation and situ experiments like um, on normal grids and then do like being uh, electron dose testing or these type of things before you start all the situ mm -hmm. experiments. Yeah, and I'll I'll go into in my talk about kind of you know what I did leading up to actually taking the video. Um, but yeah, you do yeah ex situ look at dose. Um, you know, look at heating under the beam before you introduce the gas. Like a, there's a lot of different considerations. So so a lot of head nodding here. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly not just a. Put it in and go. It takes a lot of preparation. Yes, thank yeah. you. Okay. So, Chow, in your case, yeah. um, I think uh, particularly with a with a elect, um, when you have a bias contact or optical, the contact very important for yes. detections. Yes. And then I have never done that myself before, yeah. but I hear a lot of stories. This part is really challenging and difficult, yeah. and you can lead to leakage or different types of uh, mis um, interpretation of the results. Um, I have uh, supervised some students to just make the contact. It's okay. Right. Um, just in a few sessions or even just okay. in a few hours, they know there are three directions, X, Y, Z. Yeah. Uh, so if they understand, if they understand that um, uh, TEM is 2D because, you know, yeah. it's 2D when you are looking, looking through. Um, then you need to understand um, that you uh, the the height is very important. So you can use some uh, to, for example, the the mm -hmm. or something to to uh, adjust the height. Um, then you can make a contact, but the contact might be good or not good. And uh, if you do a quick IV test, you can see if uh, if it's a straight line. Usually, it's a good sign to tell you that it's uh, omic. But 
if you see um, something very short key contact, mm -hmm. then, then you know that there are a lot of contact resistance. So a good way is to make a IV test before um, before you go to a real test with a low voltage uh, usually. And then um, the other thing is you want the contact to be stable. In this case, you can run a, a current to time test. Mm -hmm. And if you see the current is noisy and, um, and bumps to a very high and then to a very low, it means the contact is not very stable. Um, uh, for example, due to uh, the sample is illuminated by the electron beam, um, then it's heated and it's shifting, then uh, or the probe is not stable, or your air con is blowing onto the holder, so the holder is shaking, uh, or someone is speaking loud to the uh, holder. I, I tested it. If I speak loud to the holder, the, the holder will shake, right? Uh, th this kind of or the many customized shielding around the holder. Uh, so in situ, your holder is quite exposed. We need to yeah, add yeah. so many things. On. Yeah, so the best way is you do experiment in a quiet time that nobody's walking around your lab and then uh, you don't speak, you do the experiment, you run an I, uh, current uh, current time test to show it's very stable and not bumping, uh, then you can start your measurement. That, that's my experience. Is there any preferred contact material uh, for, for basically making a contact? A uh, gold. Gold is a gold. So we hear like there are quite different choices of contact materials, and there are lots of papers discussing this material better for adhesion and the others. Is it? If so it's, you always use gold. Uh, if if I make chips yeah. and place my uh, sample on it, um, then the chip is usually gold and chromium mm -hmm. um, for for lower resistance. Yes. But for holder, I usually make uh, uh, the sample onto the gold or wire. Um, I cannot call the chromium in that case, yeah, yeah. or it might be too 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 complicated. So usually gold is just fine, and gold is soft. Uh, if you um, attach the sample onto the gold, it's usually in good contact. So if it's not in good contact, in case, then you just change another sample. So lastly, I think we touch a little bit about electron dose. So I mm. think John talked about in terms of nanoparticle dose is very important. Mm -hmm. So for the, for example, you talk about um, you interested in optical electronic properties and all those probing things. Is a dose, electron dose also an issue for you? Yeah, uh, electron dose is issue if you want to test the electrical performance mm -hmm. or optical electronic yeah. performance. So um, previously when I was working on older microscope, uh, there are two ways. One is to uh, use CLA4 and a lot of um, shifting, and then um, the electron beam will not affect the sample. The other case, you just, uh, uh, the beam valve, yeah. that there's no beam onto the sample, then you start test. Uh, if it's a field emission gun and with uh, uh, the valve to be, then maybe some shake on your sample. So after that, if you still get a stable response, then that's good. If not, you, you can use the first method that I said, you can shift the beam, use CLA4 to reduce the beam. Um, yeah. Okay, right. so uh, do we have any questions? Or well, if not, let's thank Chow. And then also Joe, I'm going to show he's enjoying coffee now. And then we'll hear John's and Charles' presentations. Uh, I think John will be presenting today and Charles tomorrow. So thank you for your participation. I think we can uh, begin. Thank you so much for that non-existing introduction. Uh, I'm Ingemar. Uh, I'm a PhD uh, postdoc from uh, Sweden. And I'm working at Linköping University. I've been coming here on an international postdoc craft, uh, first to University of Sydney and then University of New South Wales. And I'm working on closed cell uh, gas and liquid TEM. And the uh, seeing institution masterclass, it's going to be more about working principles and practices than 
research examples. So I hope you will appreciate that. So the point of the flow cell uh, TM is that you want to bring uh, the lab environment tests closer to commercial uh, values. And that means uh, usually when you do, for example, gas reaction in ETEM, you work at very low pressures. Uh, and this can sometimes not be information that is transferable when, for example, do fuel cell testing or other catalytic reaction. So it, it's more like a scaling up technique, uh, hopefully when everything works. And uh, as somebody was mentioning before that this is a ship-based technique, so me mechanical systems, basically nano-reactors. So you, you, um, you still work with reactor, reactors, but very small scale. Um, and hopefully you can uh, you can enable uh, the same kind of situations that you would expect in a large reactor setup. And operando conditions, this is what it means. You want to have realistic working conditions in the TEM, which is very challenging to enable. Uh, and most uh, importantly, you want to study for gas holders. You want to study the gas, solid gas interface high pressure, high temperature. Liquid, you want a solid liquid interface in the nucleation growth or electrochemistry. Uh, and this is not easily studied by, by other techniques, especially at um, uh, liquid flow uh, and uh, at the small scale that you would expect state-of-the-art catalysts or uh, other kind of growth. Uh, mechanisms to occur. And uh, the main challenges are cost of TEM, which is typically very high, and also the cost of the MEMS ships that you need to use as consumable. And sometimes this is uh, uh, more than you would wish. Uh, sample preparation is also more tedious because it doesn't uh, really transfer from the usual way you prepare TEM samples. So you will definitely encounter some trial and error with that. You also have a lot more contamination in these cells because you confine gas between two ships in a very narrow region, and then you flow gas, and with the gas come impurities, and then you wanna do heating and you have impurities on the ships that will fly off uh, between the membranes and cause nasty contamination. And on top of that, you have the beam effects that you have to account for. And that can be quite a lot, depending on the experiments. Nanometer-sized electrodes for electrochemistry ships. Uh, this is also a complete new kind of physics because uh, electrodes are typically made on a micro size. And this can cause a lot of different effects. And then finally, the microfluidics differs a lot from larger scale tests. So it's a lot of testing to get to uh, realistic conditions. Uh, but first, I would like to talk a bit about what I've been doing the last 10 years. So this is a new community for me. I haven't presented to Microscopy Australia before. So Linköping University is where I've been based for most of the time. And uh, uh, these are people I've been working with and uh, are probably sample prep. I'm doing only TEM, so I cannot take credit for any of the beautiful samples I'm going to show. Uh, bottom row on the left is my former supervisors. I've also been doing some work at the TTU with the ETEM, Environmental TEM, uh, under the supervision of Jakob Wagner and Thomas Hansen. And uh, two-dimensional materials is the field I've been working with mostly. And uh, this guy here on the bottom right, Michel Berstum, is um, collaborator, which invented a new two-dimensional material for, called Maxine, which I'm going to talk about a bit. And this is a uh, uh, Max space called uh, uh, MAX because it has this specific layer structure, metal interleaved with 
A group elements and X is carbon and nitrogen. It's a ceramic. And then you can etch this with HF to produce two dimensional filaminate uh, layers called MX or maxines. And then you can uh, delaminate those into single sheets and characterize in TM, hopefully, if you have managed to remove all the contamination, which is very useful with in situ heating. So this is what I started with in situ heating. Uh, and then uh, moving on to real surface characterization, terminations, different temperatures, and uh, monitoring coverage using uh, hard stem and XPS for a large scale uh, collaboration. Also oxidation reduction, uh, carbon capture using ETEM. Uh, so ETEM is very powerful because you can combine a lot of techniques uh, to verify what mechanisms you have in your sample. And I think John will talk more about that later. So this is just an example of oxidation reduction of single machines. Maxine sheets seen in top view. Uh, diffraction evolution over uh, time series and composition evolution. Uh, another important thing is that you can use uh, residual gas analysis to monitor reaction products, which can be very useful to confirm uh, the reaction you are studying. And finally, discovery of new materials, especially sensitive, environmentally sensitive materials that survive for a very short time after synthesis, for example, in colloidal suspensions or even in air after dispersion. And then in situ TM is a very powerful tool if you can quickly manage to prepare your sample and isolate it in the TEM. And this is a 2D, the first 2D boride. Uh, synthesized and characterized. It was published in Science a couple of years ago. Uh, okay, moving on to gas injection holders. So ETAM has been around for uh, 30 or so years, um, at least at high resolution. And uh, these are the first closed cell reactors, which you have uh, two conventional copper ships with holes in them. Then um, covered with carbon film. That was the very first one. And this is uh, a paper in 2006. So the development after this has been very rapidly. And the, the resolution and the pressure limit was about the same as ETEM. So no real improvement. Uh, after this, a group from Delft and uh, DTU collaborated with the uh, MEMS, Microelectromechanical System Technology, to reduce the technique we are using now to silicon nitride etch lithography and uh, deposited contacts different kinds, and then you have an electric transparent window, which will, uh, when you have gas flow or liquid flow or whatever inside, will bulge up a bit because of overpressure inside the cell. And this is something that still is present in, in the state of the art, which I will talk about a bit more later on. So this is what it looks like now. This is commercial, uh, un unintentional, uh, but this is what we have to work with. Uh, so there are three main vendors. I'm not going to name them by name, but uh, they are all very similar, uh, different types, and it's two men ships with contacts, and depending on the experiment you want, you can optimize it for STEM or TEM by depositing the sample on top or below, and then STEM will hit your sample first and spread. TEM will hit your sample in the bottom to have optimal conditions for TEM mode. Uh, and then they are optimized for EDX as well. The lid is uh, etched in a way, so can uh, acquire EDX signal as well. Heating contacts, uh, closed open circuits, so you can monitor um, uh, effect increase because of endothermic or exothermic reactions. 
effect increase or decrease. And then the residual gas uh, is important to know what you are putting in your system in case of a gas holder. On the liquid cell, uh, these are, this is the first realized uh, holder for liquid flow by uh, Francis Ross Group, which is now in MIT. And this was a bulk kind of cell, a lot of vibrations. Uh, you couldn't get really nice that um, is resolution. Well, it was very thick layer of liquid inside. And this is how it looks now, MEMS technology. You can get 500 nanometer sized spacing or even 100 nanometer sized liquid. Uh, and then with these three electrode setup, used with lithography techniques, you can, you can do cyclic voltammetry. And this is typically how uh, on the right panel here, you can see a top view of the transparent uh, window, electric transparent window, how the electrodes are situated. Um, and this is very narrow uh, distances. So then you have problems with interference between reference electrode and working electrode that you have to uh, deal with. Uh, so, what information can you get by the um, Richard was talking about that in the beginning? And uh, of course, uh, I'm working on catalysis, catalysts mainly. So, the information that people want is usually a very low dimension uh, shape change, uh, structural change on surfaces, confinement, and so on, which is information that's not easily attainable by other techniques. So the situ TEM is kind of filling a niche in this area of small nanoparticles and interfaces. Uh, so you, you can use these holders to study um, catalyst site evolution. And this is uh, well summarized in a review paper. The different deactivation mechanisms you can expect, which is not easily modified. And here are some research examples from other groups. And this is from Chao Town, uh, University of California. They are studying nanoparticles using in situ TEM. And this is uh, gather eels signal, eels line scanning, in this case, across different facets. And then you can measure the coverage. Cobalt, in this case, it's cobalt from platinum. And then you can do in situ oxidation, which is, they have done with measure uh, reconstructive cobalt oxide surface. And this is another example from the same group uh, titanium oxide on palladium under reduction and oxidation conditions. And for a liquid cell, uh, this is a battery example of a um, welded and uh, silicon nanowire on a, one of these ships. Uh, and then you do cyclic charging and you see how lithium is uh, spreading across the wire. So the main challenge is you have to go, go through when you start out in this beam is that you, you have to determine the beam induced processes. And this can uh, be different uh, things you need to look at for nucleation and growth. Uh, catalyst electrolytes, solid electrolyte interface, they all uh, behave differently under the electric beam. This is an illustration uh, and also in a summary by uh, Mayhofer group. You have radiolysis in water, for example, which will change uh, the pH in your liquid, which is not good for a Electrochemistry it will cause um, gas bubbles to form, which can be uh, bad for liquid flow. And then you have other effects on the uh, electro electrode interface, for example. So, mass transport uh, is uh, very important. You need to find a way to flow gas and liquid to refresh the sample area so that your beam doesn't have that much influence. You also need to uh, 
uh, determine how your reference electrode is affecting your measurements. And this is a group by a work by a group in Toyota, which is very very far ahead in the hydrogen fuel cells at the moment. And uh, this is an OCP, which is open circuit potential. You measure it first to get a stable signal in the microscope, which can be very tricky. And uh, sometimes you can uh, you can work with an external reference electrode where you connect it to the so-called pseudo electrode inside the ship because it's made of uh, platinum and not the usual kind of materials you work with reference electrodes. Um, and then you have to find out feasible scan rates and uh, uh, other cyclic photometry parameters. Uh, and this is an, an example of the effect of electric field. Uh, yeah, electrolytes, what can happen with different strengths, a change of composition with time, which will definitely change your uh, electrolyte influence on the uh, sample, on the catalyst. And this is an uh, illustration of how different flow dynamics for different holders in a liquid cell, where the most standard so-called bathtub uh, cell, you have diffusion of the liquid, which is not really good for uh, electrocatalysts. So closed cell reactions workflow. Basically, you run a controller uh, experiment on empty ship to uh, measure the influence of just the ship. And then uh, you have to remove contamination using inner cast because if you just have vacuum, everything will stick on the ship, top ship or bottom ship. So you have to flow your contamination away. And then when you have passed those kind of things, then you can acquire operando data. And preparation workflow, we will have a lab. This is typical workflow. So you have to be clean. So you have to clean your ships. And this is a common procedure. Yes, listen here, I'm not going to read it in yourself. Uh, and then you have to deposit your sample only on the, ideally only on the transparent membrane. Otherwise you can uh, cause a short circuit on the electrodes or uh, break the seal when you put the cell together in the holder. Uh, and then you do all the testing uh, in a leak station, which is a puffing station like this. So make sure everything sealed and working correctly before you introduce it into the TEM because you don't want any accidents there. Closed liquid cell is uh, similar uh, preparation. The workflow is more tedious because you have to do basically the entire experiment in the in the leak station first, and then uh, and then you can move on to the TM. So you have to, uh, one after the other, um, remove the possibility of damages. And uh, you will always uh, encounter difficulties. Uh, and typically bad seal and failed circus is something that happens very often. Uh, cleaning can work, but most most of the time you have to prepare a new ship, and this is why cost is uh, a big problem. Uh, questions? So, pretty routinely see contamination focus setting levels um, for hydrocarbon contamination. Do you get that same problem with in situ liquid holes, gas holes? Yeah. What should we pick to the only people the question? I don't know if they hear you. Yeah. Yeah. So this question was about contamination. Uh, so you do get a lot of contamination in the gas. The liquid is a bit different because uh, you don't uh, implant in the same way. You you're more likely to destroy. Uh, so for the gas holder, uh, running heating experiments in inert flow. It's the best way, at least that's my experience. 
Thank you. Can I maybe I stick a step through it too quickly? I can. This is typically the workflow um, I use to see what kind of contamination we have. <clears throat> Do you have a question about your nest in the gas flow? What yeah. do you use for it? Do you do anything to sort of check that there's not other stuff in, the, in that, that gas? Like, you know, for instance, some vessels that the university have their moisture in. Yeah. Uh, so the best way is to have an RDA, right? so that you know exactly what you're blowing. Uh, RDA is also very useful to know exactly uh, what kind of gas mixture you get if you have mixture. Uh, because the mass flow, technique that some vendor use is not really accurate all the time. And the static mixing in tanks that some vendors use is also not really accurate all the time. So the gas uh, analysis is important. Yeah. If the, Back. Yeah, question about some operations, but before it came to the you have some experience if you need uh, not that the drop cast, but if you want to put uh, equal amount of wires or equal some metal or on a working electron, do you have some experience, for example, if you're using it, maybe uh, yeah, some equals shoes and stuff on a working electron. So the question is about um, placing a fib lamella? No, 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 no. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, I have less experience with this. But I have many colleagues that have been battling quite a lot. Um, the most common issue that platinum doesn't really uh, adhere to the sample. And uh, also, if you have a big lamella that you want to weld across the window, this is an issue when you are heating and flowing gas or liquid because the window bulges up. Yes. And then the, the lamella will break or fly off. Or, uh, so there's, I haven't seen any good recipe for even 75% uh, yes. success. We try actually said, how was it going on? Like, yeah, because the similar window is so yeah. easy to grow. So we got these very easy to press with me to lay the place. Yeah. What do you think? Yes, sir. Uh, it's a very good question, and uh, uh, I would like to know that too. So this is a question. Um, did you try any um, flow with any gas counter uh, with sulfur in it? So any sulfuric gases in it? Because more milk, lots of geological processes would have this kind of uh, gas, which are fairly corrosive most of the time. Is, is, is that only dependent on the chemical compatibility of the cell itself? Or have you have any, have any comment on this kind of... Uh... Uh, so you have um, replaceable tubings in the entire holder. And then uh, there are things you don't want to damage, for example, the contacts in the holder. So you have to be careful uh, to clean. If you're using anything corrosive, you have to clean very thoroughly after every experiment. Uh, there's a list of all kinds of gas that are supported, and then you can try out yourself to be prepared to replace all kinds of consumable parts. Uh, but yeah, some some sometimes it's a not a good idea to try the really corrosive things. Yeah. I have a quick question about the, the energetics involved in rotating nanoparticles on the surface. I mean, it's called a rotation, but it can't actually be a rotation. Surely it's just a transformation. So it's a crystal lattice transformation, much like our energy rotation, transporting all those atoms in a circle. In yeah. Circle. Yes. Yeah. Um... So has anyone done any, any, any uh, computational dynamic you know, facts about the I'm genetics not, involved? What's actually more likely? I'm not aware of any simulations on nanoparticles. I think it's uh, difficult. You you do simulations on model systems because then you work with yeah. uh, periodicity. Nanoparticles, then it becomes supercells, and it's much more difficult. 
and especially if you have connected with a support that is asymmetric. Uh, so I, I'm not aware of any simulations in this sense. Uh, I have seen other papers on rotations as well. So uh, because the, the crystal seem to uh, keep its shape. It's not like it's constantly transforming in, into new, new shapes. Okay. Um, so first off, thank you to Richard uh, and all the organizers. Um, it's great to come back down under, even though I'm like three hours from home and I can't go over there, but it's still great to come back down to Oz. Uh, so today I'll talk about inorganic transformations in, in an environmental TEM. Uh, so I am at the Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies, which is a joint venture nanoscale research center um, held by Los Alamos National Laboratory and Sandia National Laboratory. Uh, I am a I am a LANL employee, but I work at the Sandia site, which is where all of our microscopes are. Uh, so this is the, the SYNT core facility, we call it. Um, so this is at Sandia National Labs. Uh, I took this picture out of the airplane a couple of trips ago. I thought it was kind of, kind of cool. So we have a clean room, a chemistry wing, and a characterization wing. So all of our microscopes uh, and the characterization wing um, and the Sandia mountains are over here. Uh, so my goal is certainly not to steal users from the EMU, but uh, my management would, would be angry if I didn't put this up. So we are a user facility. Uh, access to our facility is free with a, a, a short user proposal. So um, if there's anything that we can collaborate on or we'll do some work, then I'd be happy to discuss. So um, an overview, I will give a, a brief description about the, the ETEM um, and kind of compare to the in, in situ holder, which Ingmar started, uh, and then um, kind of go into a little bit more detail about the platinum islands on ruthenium work that uh, we collaborated with. And then show an example of um, observing Worcestite to magnetite nanoparticle observation in situ, which I believe is going to be a, a demo on, on iron oxide sedation. And then just some of the things to consider when going through uh, an in situ data set. So this is our ETEM. Uh, it was installed in 2017. So it's a Titan, it's monochromated, it's image corrected. Um, uh, we have, at the moment, we have a, a K2, K2IS camera on there, um, and I don't have a picture of the gas car, which is a little strange. Um, so this has a, um, a custom gas car, which is on the side here. Um, obviously, this was taken before the gas car was installed. Uh, so the, the thing about an ETEM is that it has a differential pumping system, um, so we can get up to about 10 to 20 millibars of uh, pressure within the ETEM. Uh, we can introduce uh, flammables, inerts, and oxidizers, um, and then run some institute experiments. Uh, so at the moment, we have a K2 IS camera on there. Um, coming at the end of this year, we'll be getting um, like a GIF continuum, um, K3IS. Uh, a lot of the data that I'm going to show you today came from when we had a K3IS beta site. So they put one of these on uh, as a beta test just before the start of the pandemic. Uh, so that's where kind of all of this data comes from. Oh, here's the gas card. Okay, great. So yeah, this is the, a, a custom gas cart that was built in-house uh, by one of the scientists that runs the clean room. So we can attach kind of 15 different gases and lecture bottles. Um, and so we have a, a flammables uh, and a nerd and an oxidizer. And then we have a line for nitrogen as well. So we can add 15 gases. Uh, we can do custom mixing uh, into the tool. So there's a few stipulations from Thermo. Uh, we can't go over 10 millibar for reactive gases. We can't go over 20 millibar for nitrogen. And we can't mix like flammables and oxidizers, obviously. So those are interlocked. Um, 
So we have like a list of approved gases that, you know, if we go outside of that, then we void our service contract. But if we want to do anything kind of outside uh, of the norm, then we just kind of chat to Fermo and, and see what they're happy for us to do. But we can put in, you know, small organics. I think we can go up to propane, that kind of thing. So the nice thing about, about ETM uh, is that it's very easy to, to mix gases. Um, it's very easy to get controlled delivery. Uh, and it, it's relatively tactile. Um, so it's all just controlled through the, uh, what do they call it? Um, whatever the, the, I'm blanking, the, the Thermo Fisher UI. Um, it's much, much lower than atmospheric pressure. So 10, 10 millibars or 20 millibars. Uh, so a lot of the times, you know, if you have some reaction that you're wanting to see, you may need to heat up, which uh, Richard alluded to where ex situ, he was 200 degrees, in situ, we were 600 degrees. Um, and there's some, you know, there are some times where we will hit, uh, hit a process that, you know, really can't be driven by these low, uh, low gas pressures, but for the most part, you can find conditions where you can drive the reaction. Um, uh, getting atomic resolution is pretty straightforward because of these relatively low pressures. Um, as Felipe said, there's no windows, so you're not trying to go through a silicon nitride window. Um, and especially with image correction, that makes it pretty straightforward. Uh, the other thing that's kind of like, and aside to in situ, that's nice about an ETM um, is that it's almost impossible to crash the vacuum because you have so much pumping power um, at the pole piece that, you know, when you insert your holder, you don't even see the octagon pressure jump. You can just open up to, uh, you know, three turbo pumps pumping on the pole piece. Um, and then, you know, so for things like liquid experiments or cryo, these types of things, you just have a very robust column. Um, what's the other point? Uh, like there's a plasma cleaner in there as well. So we can just like turn the plasma cleaner on and clean everything out, um, which makes it quite nice. Uh, but the main kind of point uh, that's nice about ETM is that it's compatible with any holder. So uh, obviously heating. So all of these experiments were done with an Aduro heating holder, which is Gatan's, uh, sorry, Protochip's very old holder, uh, but just heats the sample and that's fine. Anything that's biasing, we also do a lot of uh, nanomechanics, so stress and strain. Um, so you can just put in a stress and strain holder that you would use somewhere else and then run gas over it. Uh, a lot of people in metals research are really into that, looking at hyd hydrating of steels. Um, and then tomorrow I'll show a few examples of lithiation. Uh, so looking uh, at lithiation of novel cathode materials. And then, you know, we have things like Lorentz mode and that as well, which we can do. So um, this is the, I'll talk about that in a sec. So now I'll get into a little bit of the research. Uh, and so uh, Richard already introduced this system where you have uh, branched ruthenium nanostructures that have these low index facets, which make them, make them very stable. Uh, and then this image, I think it was taken on the ETM, right? But this was just taken in, uh, you know, in, in bright field mode with no gas. This was the paper previous. Um, we don't run a cryo cycle on the ETM. You basically just leave the turbos on, pumping on the column. So that's nice. You don't put cryogen on it. Uh, if you want to move to high vac mode, you put on cryogen. If you're using a cryo holder, you put on cryogen because you don't want your sample to be the coldest thing in the microscope. But uh, in general, we basically just don't run a cryo cycle and just leave it pumping. So it's, it's very nice in that way. And you can still get really, really nice images with the aberration correction. And then Richard introduced this system. Uh, so I won't belabor it too much, but basically, you know, our goal in the collaboration was to look and see if we could observe these platinum islands annealing into the ruthenium. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, just before the pandemic, Gatan was looking for a place to put the K3IS. Uh, so this was on beta test. Uh, so all of this data was generated kind of, yeah, just before the pandemic. And then I think we had it on for quite a while through it as well. It kind of like delayed them taking it off. And 
during uh, during all the restrictions, they let the well, they wanted a fifty percent occupancy, so all the theorists and managers went home, and all the experimentalists stayed in the lab, and so we got to run more experiments with this, which was really nice. <laughs> P3IS, uh, you know, has has very high frame rates. Uh, frame rates. The main difference between the the K3 and the K2, um, other than the K3 works, and the K2 well, um, is uh, single electron counting in video mode. Um, but the the other thing that's really nice is you know in K2 you had to do what's called uh, summit mode, which is basically taking images. And then you'd stop, you'd do all your gain corrections again, and you go to in situ mode. Um, so while you know it was very powerful, uh, it was it made for kind of slow process because if you wanted to be in, in situ, you would have to get all of your uh, you know conditions right, and then you know be in movie mode. But with the K3, basically it just works like a CETA, right? So you can go around, click, and take images, and when you see something interesting, you take off and you do your experiment and just take the video. So Beautiful camera, um, and I'm really, really looking forward to getting one back because we had to give the K3 back and go back to K2. That was that was pretty tough. Uh, wide field of view, which is really nice. So uh, for this work, uh, for this experiment, you can see the large field of view that we're taking with the K3IS, and I'll show in some of the magnetite work. Um, you know, just how much information you can get from from being back at kind of 50,000. 50, uh, which is really nice for in situ because it means you're not trying to zoom in on you know a single area and try and capture something. You can capture a large field of view and then go, okay, where's the thing that's doing the business? Um, which is really nice for the user. Uh, the other thing, and, and this will become apparent, you know, as as we move forward, uh, is live frame averaging. So basically, this is where you know you can be taking if you're at kind of well, let's say thirty five thousand frames per second like the amount of dose into the image is so low that our eyes can't see it right you're basically just looking at uh, like a black screen with a bit of noise um but you know it's collecting all of that data but what they do in with k3 was that they'll you know there'll some frames and show you that frame with a higher signal to noise while they're collecting all of that all of that raw data on the back end um so you can actually visualize uh what's happening in the reaction and then you know go back and use all, all the, the raw data. Uh, the other really nice feature was the look back feature. So we use this pretty extensively where uh, you know it's taking five seconds of video and then dumping that just like a uh, like a dash cam, you know. And so then when you see something that's happening, you press record and it collects all the data from five seconds uh, in front. Um, so that's a really nice feature. So um, but yeah, as we move forward. This is the region of interest that all of this data was kind of the, the publishable data was taken from. And so we still have all of this data around it that, um, you know, machine learning AI people can then take and like get statistics on what's happening. Um, so, you know, the story is not really over with this work or this data set. And, uh, you know, Richard alluded to the size of the data sets. Um, I can't remember exactly how, how big this is, but, uh, you know, it's not uncommon for a two to three minute video to be, you know, terabyte multiples of terabytes. Um, so I don't know what your data transfer solution was, but being at uh, a national security laboratory, all of our microscopes are off network. And so we are hard drives. Um, so here is the video, Richard showed this video. Um, so a little bit of, in, in terms of the setup. So this is using our older, uh, heating holder um, in a Duro 300. So, you know, I think this, this is almost a decade old, which is kind of, you know, uh, two things in that you can still get, get good data with what you have, um, but also it kind of shows the robustness of the, uh, the like, um, feature tracking and alignment that Ben Miller from Catan did, did for us. So, uh, one of the first things to do is, you know, uh, there's been mention of beam effects. So how do you know that the heating's doing this and the gas, uh, and how do you know it's not the beam? So the first thing I did was I heated the sample to about 500 degrees C uh, and heavily dosed the sample. 
and basically observe no change. Okay, so that's the first step. You eliminate beam effects. And then the idea is to flow in your gas um, and, and see what happens. So you'll notice here it says flow 100% H2 gas, um, 10 millibars, so ramp it up to 10 millibars and then ramp the temperature. So at least with ETEM, um, this was something I, I learned and kind of had to change my perspective on how to run it. So basically, um, you know, this idea of having a sample and then pushing a gas front across the sample, right? Like a step change in the pressure, it's not going to work because, because of your drift. Um, and so what you really need to do is, is get your pressure stable and then increase your temperature to kind of initiate the reaction. And the drift you get, especially with these new holders um, and things like, you know, uh, Axon that has drift correction and, and a bunch of just um, other kind of great new technologies is that the temperature tends to, you know, create less drift than the gas. And so yeah, you flow up to 10 millibars, um, get that stable and then, and then introduce your heat. You can get faster at getting to that pressure when you get to know your system. Um, because you know the way that the ETM works is basically you have two leak valves. So you control your pressure to the feed point, uh, which we do use in the gas cart. And then there's like a um, like a diaphragm type valve that you open. And then there's one uh, after the column as well. And so the, the, the pressure in the column is based on the size of those two leak valves. So you may you know have a, a table that's like, if I want to get to 10 millibar of nitrogen, then I know my leak valve values um, and you can go there quicker. Uh, but the thing with the leak valves is that they, they increase temperature very slowly to start with. And then as you get to that set point and you open them slightly, it like it opens exponentially. So you can, you know, you can also get to the, the danger of, of dumping the column and, and affecting the fig. But um, for the most part, you can get quicker, uh, but it's not kind of instantaneous. And then use this uh, look back feature, as I mentioned. Um, and you can see the platinum nodes. These are very highly compressive, the, the one Richard Trigger's nice said. And this is an early um, you know, uh, manipulation of the data. I think the final video was, was twisted like that. So this, all of this work uh, in terms of analyzing the data and making the videos, this was all done in GMS, Catan Digital Microgram. Um, we worked very closely with Ben Miller, who was writing a bunch of Python code at the time, uh, and probably still is. But yeah, all of this was done in GMS, so it's it's very nice. And here's just another video, and you can see we've got the FFT, and then we're also, you know, again we're looking at the small region, but you can see uh, a bunch of different, you know, you can see the mouse, um, a bunch of other different nodes. So there's a lot more information to be kind of pulled out of this data, should we want it. So here's the final video. I'm not seeing the mouse. Eh? No, okay. Here's the final video, um, and you can see the platinum nodes in the lane there. A um, couple of features which I think are really interesting as it turns around, and it might be hard to see. But you'll see some pixels kind of floating around. See like a pixel here. And they kind of they look like they're bouncing around. Um, so that's a single static dead pixel in the camera. But because of our alignments, that looks like it's bouncing around in the image. Uh, and then in terms of the material, you know, we start to see more fringes appear as this node comes in right there. Um, and there's a little bit, you know, uh, with drift, right? We always think of it as, as X, Y, but there's also some Z drift. And so you'll see that this edge site will kind of come in and out of focus as well. A little bit in and out of focus as this just went down. Um, just kind of showing, I guess, that, you know, it's a real world system. And then, yeah, it was great to be able to pull out this atomic resolution information. So, you know, that's one of the nice things about E10 is that um, you really don't change that much between your point resolution and high vacuum 
a 10 millibar. Um, you know, we might go from like 0.8 angstrom to 1.1 angstrom or something like that, which you know, for these heavy metals is more than enough. So moving on to another system. Why I did it at 600? Uh, just to account for the low pressure. Ah, yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's a very good point. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's the other thing, right? Like, um, yeah, if we were going to do, uh, you know, if we were going to do this at, at that temperature or, you know, at 400 or 500, something like that, then, you know, this video could be, yeah, one hour, right? Uh, and so there's two things which are no good for that is, uh, if you're taking it at an appreciable frame rate, I mean, you're just not going to have the disk space or the hard drive space. Um, it's going to be too big. And then if you're taking it, you know, um, one frame every 30 seconds or something, you might miss some transient states. Uh, the other thing is if you're, you know, if you're taking all that data and then summing across to kind of bin the data and make it manageable, then you're smearing any kind of events that have happened, right? Um, so that... Those are kind of three considerations in terms of making this, uh, you know, manageable, but also making sure that you're not missing any key intermediates. Yeah, thanks for the prompt. Um, yeah. Any questions on that, but Yeah, um, it sounds like the real window of conditions to run this at this particular sample. Mm -hmm. How much, I guess, screening machine does it take to arrive at those yeah that's a that's a great question for the middle of my talk because on the next system i'll go into that <laughs> yeah that's great um so it does take some work yeah you're not just going to capture this straight away for sure so now yeah i'll move on to a different system uh so this is magnetite nanoparticles so uh uh I, when I moved to Sandia, I post op with, with Dal Huber, uh, and he has spent a lot of time kind of perfecting the synthesis of magnetite nanoparticles. Uh, this has been in collaboration uh, with a few different researchers and companies, um, primarily looking at like uh, biomedical diagnostic tools, so hypothermia, um, MRI contrast agents, magnetic particle imaging, uh, but also for um, soft magnetic components. So with all of these kind of applications, the, the real um, thing that you're wanting to exploit is the magnetic relaxation of magnetite. Uh, and that is very dependent on the size and the shape and also the, the quality of the particles. Uh, and so he developed the synthesis that um, can get very, very tight uh, size control, so down around you know four five percent, and he can uh, you know make these particles any size you like, that kind of thing. Um, but one of the things that there was a paper kind of a few years following this this study, um, and this is ceramagetic in collaboration with some people out at the University of York. So they took uh, magnetite nanoparticles. So each one of these same size, but it's made with a different, very kind of famous technique um, and then the, the the difference between these particles is some have very very strong magnetic saturation and some have very weak magnetic saturation which is also a very key factor in how these perform um, and then they you know put them on on the nylon uh, you know very very high resolution very high ultra high vacuum stem uh, and they were able to show that it's the presence of these antiphase boundaries um, these kind of defects that can reduce the MSAT. And so this is uh, something that we wanted to explore. So uh, Dale's hypothesis was that um, it's the, uh, the speed of oxidation. So when these are formed, they're formed as, as Wustite, FeO. Then they undergo an oxidation, an ex situ oxidation, form high, uh, high quality magnetite. Uh, if you have a rapid oxidation, um, basically, we were seeing a, a depressed inset, and the idea here is that you have, um, you know, multiple oxidation, uh, multiple nucleation sites for oxidation at the surface, 
and then you're basically getting defects when these fronts meet. If you have uh, very slow controlled oxidation, then you know you're probably maybe only nucleating at one site, um, and you get a, a nice single crystal. So we wanted to look at this in, in the ETM um, in situ and see if we could track the oxidation of, of type to magnetite. Um, so this is kind of throwing back a little bit to the power of K3 and this wide field of view. So, you know, typically if you're doing, uh, say you're doing high resolution characterization of your nanoparticles, right, you might zoom up to 300, 400 KX and um, you know, take an image of two or three nanoparticles um, and, and get that very nice high resolution data. Uh, so if you're trying to track something in situ at atomic res, you know, to zoom up that high and then you know, start, your, uh, start your gas flow, stabilize it, increase your temperature, you're just gonna, it's just gonna, you're gonna lose it, right? Um, you, know, you might have some very nice uh, like feature tracking alignment Type of uh, things, but that, it's very difficult at high, at, at high magnification. So that's the great thing about the K3. So here we are back at like a broad ensemble of nanoparticles, and you can see just picking um, you know, random particles, we're getting uh, lattice fringes, and this is at 34 kx. So in terms of watching the oxidation, and this comes back to your question, uh, how do we start to you know, narrow down that window of like, what are, our, what are our conditions in the TEM? So you might have, uh, you know, this oxidation was at 260 versus 120, right, ex situ. So how does that relate to what we're seeing in the ETEM? Uh, how does that relate to having a nanoparticle that's in solution compared to a nanoparticle on the surface of a grid? having uh, one atmosphere or increased pressure, uh, you know, ex situ compared to 10 millibar, 20 millibar in the e -tem. So you can use those ex situ uh, conditions as like a starting point, but then, you know, you really have to figure out where are you going to uh, in situ. So this was the first experiment I ran. So this is just putting drop casting Worcestite um, onto, a nano, onto a grid. Um, and then this is, taking a real, like a real diffraction pattern. So of a large ensemble, uh, I can't remember the magnification, but you know, it's taking a, a wide range of nanoparticles and just heating and, and, and tracking and being like, okay, what's the macroscopic feature that I can see that helps me to nail down where the business is happening. So I'll start, stop it here. So this is Worcestite. Um, so you've got two main peaks and then Peak up here. There is a small amount of the wood of the magnetite 220, and that's because these were prepared, um, they were brought out of the box, the nitrogen box, um, as worcestite, and then you know um, the solution was warmed up and then they were diluted and then drop cast onto the onto the chip. So there's a small amount of time where these particles were exposed. So this is a very thin shell thing. Um, on the surface there. But then as I start the video, what I'm looking for is this becoming a stronger peak. With, with iron oxide, there's a lot of peaks that overlap. And so you kind of have to look for these like signature fingerprint peaks. So for this uh, transformation, this peak will emerge strong. And then this one here is going to split into three. And you can kind of see that happen. This one's strong and then this splits. And that's where I know that, you know, now I know my temperature, right? Now I know like where I should be looking. Um, so these are, these are the conditions. So this is uh, kind of like a, a raw image uh, and it's not even raw. I think this might be, this is brightness contrast adjusted of a raw image, just basically to see, you know, where things are. Um, so I drop cast single crystal, single crystal FEO. So this is at 56,000 that I'm going to do the in situ experiment. So K3 really enables us to do that, um, which is really nice. Um, controlling dose, so 10 electrons per pixel per second. I found for most like inorganic particles, like five to 10 electrons per pixel per second is a, is a nice starting dose rate. Um, it gives you, you know, pretty good uh, contrast, 
and pretty good signal to noise. And then you can always kind of go down from there. Um, and then, yeah, this is with the live frame averaging and the, and the look back feature. So definitely uh, appreciated all the features that K3 had. So this was the next uh, kind of like nailing down conditions. This was, a, this was looking at an ensemble of particles uh, and watching them oxidize. Um, and then this is uh, another uh, poem that was written by Ben Miller. So this is radial integration of the FFT. So this is not diffraction data. This is FFT from the bright field image. So basically, this is your central spot across the top. So this is time going this way. Um, so you're basically like, what he does is he takes the FFT, radially integrates, and then plots it over time. So here I'm seeing the emergence of that 220 uh, in, in bright fields. Uh, and then I can nail down where I'm getting the change in temperature. So now from this data set, so this is the, the data set that I'm, this is the big in situ data set. Now it's like, okay, which particle can I find within that data set that's going to give me the information I need? Um, and also what's happening too. So this is another video. So this is, um, again, all done in GMS. So this is 10 frames that have been summed and aligned within GMS. Um, gives you a cumulative, cumulative dose. This is kind of a slow video video, but I'll let it run. Um, and so what I'm looking for here is, is some kind of transformation in the, in the image. And if you see this contrast, you'll see that this contrast in these particles kind of bleeds out. So that's one of the issues with the, the magnetite or the, the iron oxide oxidation is, you know, you, you're not actually seeing any type of structural change. Um, because they stay spherical. You're seeing a slight expansion um, in, in the volume, but that's very difficult to track. Um, you know, there's no change in, in, in kind of um, like contrast of ind individual uh, atoms. So like, how do we know which particle is transforming? How do we know which one's on zone and doing the business? And it turns out that this contrast was actually a really helpful handle to make us understand what's happening. So you can see that that contrast is bled out now. Uh, and from the literature, um, we found these cubes where they had a spinel rock salt uh, core shell particle. Uh, and then over time, that kind of contrast led out and we were left with a, a uniform contrast. So this is a really nice kind of macroscopic tool to help us you know, find a transformation that's happening that doesn't have like a structural change. Because, uh, yeah, to the eye, nothing's really happening. So now the idea is to find the right particle, right? Um, in terms of looking at these antiphase boundaries, we want to be on the 110 uh, or the 112. And then, um, you know, we want to be able to know when it's done that, that change from a core shell through to a, a single crystal. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, there is drift. So uh, if I just go between these two, you can see that there is drift in the sample. So, you know, we were using the older Arduro, so we did have a lot of drift. So um, basically the, the idea was within all of these in-situ data sets, how do I find a nanoparticle, the drift vector was this way. How do I find a nanoparticle that starts here and transforms like here before it leaves the thing? Because then now I can use the, the post-processing alignments, right, to, to bring that. You know, and often you'd find one coming out here that looked really nice, but before it's transformed, it's like off the thing. So that's that's the particle du jour, I guess. So from T0, we see that contrast, and then we see that contrast go. So then now I, what I want to do is turn that into a, you know, a video that we can analyze, um, and that's not like a terabyte. And so using GMS, you can basically like cut out regions of interest, um, you know, select a region of interest. You can sum frames, um, you know, do a bunch of post-processing to kind of get your, your video. So here, this is actually the, uh, a true raw image. Um, so this is 25 frames per second. So uh, 
uh, very low dose. And so this is where that live frame averaging I was talking about is really helpful because if you were just looking at this going across the screen while you're doing the experiment, I mean, you're not going to see, you're not going to be able to see a change. So this is post-processing, summing and aligning 10 frames. So just bearing in mind that, um, you know, you are smearing out the image when you summon a line across 10 frames to increase signal to noise. Um, if you're looking for some very, very fast process, then perhaps that's not the procedure that you want to do. Uh, but, but for this, it was perfect. And then select an ROI and align for drift. So this is all, again, done in GMS. Um, and you can see with this that it's off the screen before that transformation's happened. So basically, me just going from that large field of view and then selecting a little box and saying, hey, track this particle was like too aggressive, right? So what I had to do was kind of step down. Um, so start from here. And you can see you have more you know, other particles around it. It's still quite a large, a large video. But now my particle has stayed in the field of view and now I can step down again. And now I have my final, my final nanoparticle that's on the zone that I want. Um, it's doing the transformation that we want um, and, and it's staying within the field of view. And so we are working um, with some, some collaborators to, uh, to clean up like the, the, the noise on the large data sets um, and see if we can find statistics on these, on these transformations. Uh, so just to finish up, I'll kind of discuss a little bit about this, this contrast, which was kind of puzzled us a lot, was, you know, what is this contrast um, and, and what can we tell from it? And so as is sometimes the case with this stuff, you scour the literature and you kind of rack your brains and then it's not until you get in the room with the right person and they go, oh, that's Ashby Brown contrast because they know the literature from back in the day. Um, and so this, this contrast comes from the thin film, uh, the old thin, thin film literature. So basically when you have a small spher spherical inclusion in a thin film, and you've got coherent strain around that interface. So no misfit uh, dislocations, um, you get this contrast called Ashby Brown contrast. Uh, it's been seen in core shell nanoparticles as well. And then, you know, you kind of think back to all the particles you've looked at in the past and there's the Ashby Brown contrast. Um, so the way that this, uh, basically the, the contrast is perpendicular. If you're in a, like a weak two beam condition, it's perpendicular to the, like the, the weak beam spot. Uh, in a bright field, it's perpendicular to the main reflection. So this matches up well. And so what we're seeing Basically, as we're seeing um, a change, yeah, we're seeing a change in the um, the size of the inclusion and a change in that strain around the interface, um, and then we go to to uh, like a um, thing of no contrast. So, if we go back and look at the literature, um, should have the citation here, but. Uh, there was some, some modeling done um, quite a few years ago where basically they showed that if, you, if this inclusion like drops down within the thin film, um, you get a flipping of that contrast. And in fact, that's, that's what we see, right? So you see it's like light, dark, light, dark. Light, dark, light, dark, and then it flips. Dark, light, dark, light, and then it goes to no contrast. So what's happening in the in situ? Uh, well, we're on a carbon support, right? And so we're not getting oxidation from below. Um, so we're basically passing the oxygen across the top and we're, we're preferentially oxidizing the top and we're dropping that inclusion and, and dropping the making like an asymmetric core shell particle. And um, we've done some modeling and some simulation in gems. Uh, so this is looking down the particle now, so this is down the one one oh, um, and we're getting that flipping in contrast, albeit not the same phase, not the same amplitude, but you know we're never going to like exactly replicate that particle um, in terms of modeling. 
So that's it from me. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, my collaborators. Um, so yeah, you get Ben, ben Miller, um, Stephen Mick as well, who was uh, helping us with the install and kind of the beta test. They were, they were instrumental in, in getting this data kind of analyzed and understanding what we were looking at. And then of course, uh, Richard and Sashan and Lucien Agus for the experimental uh, data uh, for the system. And Dale and uh, uh, Barry Carter was the one that told me that that's hash uh, yeah. So thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. yep. I just had a question about um, is it possible to connect mass spec to exhaust? Uh, just for example, the piece of gas cell holder, you can connect mass spectroscopy to if it's in the No, well, I don't want to say you can't. Oh, sorry. That's right. I always forget that. The question is can you hook a mass spec to an ETM so that you can tell what's coming off? Um, I don't know of any way to do it to to uh, ETM. I'm not not to say that's not possible. Um, there is a residual gas analyzer, um, but I think that you know that's in the tool. Uh, but I think that's more about. I know people have tried to like look for outgassing off sample from from an RGA, uh, but I think that's also quite tricky because you, you don't have a lot coming off the surface. Yeah. So it's not something we routinely do. Yeah. And then we get it. Yeah, the question is, can you still use it as a normal TM? And absolutely. Yeah. No, no, not at all. I have a limitation for you. Okay. It's the different timing app, which is cut off the lane scan. Usually, the original ATEM could do stem effective. Differential pumping apertures would cut off the high angle scattering. So, the differential pumping apertures would cut off the, the high angle scattering for stem. Um, yeah, I mean, we can do stem. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we're not, uh, you know, we're not pro corrected, we're not super high resolution, but um, I mean, yeah, I think like we're, we're spec to, to pretty good. Maybe it's a. It's a Oh, okay. You have to oh, okay. Essentially, cut off. We use a very narrow, harder detector to see signal. Right. Things. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, Richard. Charles, did you have time? I want to say that if you do want to go and use this facility, it is absolutely fantastic. I think it's a very difficult. And students go to this open. Okay. Uh, stay and do six hours with John. So yes. it's a relatively straightforward process. You put in a proposal. So I do recommend it. They do have facilities that we don't have in Australia. Um, I'll just reiterate to the online that Richard was very supportive of us being a user community. And please, uh, yeah, please engage. Um, we take samples. Uh, you know, Richard has sent over students. So uh, especially in the summer, you know, we can host students to to get experience with these things. Um, and appreciate that. Question. Um, the beautiful talk. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'd love to have the opportunity to you. Uh, if I had, if I had the research going on in that area, um, how much? It's a real practical question. Actually, is how much downtime do you have to deal with anything to 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 prepare the vacuum system to to keep the system running compared to a normal industry? Um, the question is how much downtime do we have to kind of clean things out and keep things running. And to be honest, it's super robust. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you you train people to flush with nitrogen afterwards, run the plasma cleaner. Um, but no, I mean, you can, yeah, you can run all week with the ETM. Um, you know, the other thing I'll say with the ETM is it's 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 very stable in terms of the flow. So once you get to you know your ten millibars or whatever, you can tell it to stabilize the the computers will take care of the leak valves. And I mean, you know, you're not necessarily dosing the sample, but I, I can go and get lunch and come back half an hour later and see if anything's happened. Um, so yeah, it, it is a very robust tool. Uh, and I will say as well, just to reiterate, at, at the end of, uh, you know, towards the end of our summer, so your 
spring. Um, we should have Institute ELs and the K3 IES back on the tool. So it's going to be really nice. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. All right. Okay. So um, that's uh, did you see platinum diffuses into the ruthenium? Are uh, there some ruthenium polycrystals formed? Uh, yeah, I mean, we didn't see the platinum ourselves with, with the bright fields. Um, that's kind of what I think in situ eels will be really nice for is can we actually see the platinum and where it's going? Um, you know, does it kind of go in and hang out and then move around or, or what's happening? So that's kind of the next step. Uh, and in terms of like, uh, like macroscopic crystalline changes in the ruthenium. Uh, we didn't see that. And I think that's because, you know, um, these guys did so much hard work getting them stable and they're stable to, you know, under catalytic conditions. And so I think we saw that in the e team as well. Uh, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Chao Zhang from QUT. Um, so my talk today will be more about probing holders rather than uh, the gas holders or liquid holders. Um, and my main focus is on 1D or 2D materials, which probing holders are uh, good at. Uh, I do an introduction on the Institute probing in TEM, and then um, just uh, introduce you our electrical, optical, and the mechanical holders. Uh, and then some examples of, of well, 1D nano wires or 2D nano sheets and um, their combinations. For example, some compounds are uh, mixed with the graphene, for example. And then some uh, conclusions. Uh, what I'll focus on in this uh, um, master class is more about how to's and our problem solving during the experiments. Um, as Richard said yesterday, um, there's a lot of things behind um, the data. And then I'll talk about the limitations as well, as you may expect it. Um, so we have a lot of stimuli uh, to be added or to be detected from the microscope via different uh, in situ or operando setups. And um, in my case, it's more about probing. So uh, I focus more on bias and uh, light in this case. Um, so you already know the resolution of TEM is provided by the low wavelength of uh, electrons. When electrons are accelerated to a high voltage, the resolution is supported by the diffraction equations. Uh, while we can touch as well um, onto the nano-sized structures. This is um, backed by the um, by the piezo manipulators. So piezo man manipulators, they have a coefficient uh, to link the voltages with um, the, 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 uh, the shape of the material on um, uh, three axes. And that is about uh, sub-nanometers. Uh, the microscopes in QT are mainly uh, Neo Arm uh, and uh, Joe 2100. Uh, both are working fine. We have another microscope, Joe 1400. But, uh, not much users are using that microscope currently. Uh, due to low resolution, but both of these microscopes are working very well. Uh, I have done a lot of in situ experiments on the uh, 2100 without field emission done. I'm okay with that. And now we have the new microscope since um, it was established during the COVID time. Uh, and after COVID time, uh, we started to use this microscope for our experiments. Um, the special part of this microscope is, uh, is that it has beam detector. Um, so it's called IDES, that there's a shutter there to uh, deflect the beam uh, in a relatively fast speed. And uh, you can tune the dose by just dragging the percentage in the software. So you don't have to um, tune the dose uh, 
for example, via brightness or uh, CLA, it's uh, reduce the beam dose in the software and the deflector will uh, blank some of those uh, dose. This can be quite um, uh, useful for some sensitive materials. For example, highlight props guide, I usually use this function. Uh, the institute holders are uh, led and supported by uh, uh, Professor Dimitri, a uh, laureate professor in QT. And the holders are mainly two types. One is prop type, uh, like STM holder that has, a, you see here is a piezo tube, which can um, move X, Y, and Z. And there's a SACA rail here that can um, uh, go forward and backward in a course mode. Um, the other kind of probe holder is the STM FM holder. On the right side is the same. There's a piezo tube, which can uh, manipulate the, the probe. Uh, on the left side, there is an FM cantilever sticking out. And then your material on, on the probe can be attached to the cantilever as well. And then you can do some pencil test. The other type of holder is the uh, chips holder. Some attempts to including liquid uh, chips or uh, heating chips to um, do something. Uh, I believe they also have uh, some uh, holders for FBI uh, standards. Um, but in our case, all of those are jokes. Um, by applying probes or chips, we can um, observe a lot of dynamics of the nanomaterials, including, uh, um, for example, lithium ion batteries. These are very widely used uh, in, in many uh, research papers. Uh, this experiment is relatively easy to do then to apply some lithium and observe how lithium goes into the uh, samples, what kind of compound it, it generates. But of course, you already know that it's not 100% of lithium um, battery uh, uh, process, some kind of uh, process with the lithium metal and lithium oxide as uh, uh, solid electrolyte to see what kind of compound it goes, what kind of chemistry it may be. And uh, by applying probes, we can also uh, deform the materials and uh, while at the same time to get the uh, electrical performance of those materials. And if we have light uh, shining onto the material by an optical fiber, then we can test the photocurrent, uh, the photocurrent spectroscopy, the photovoltage, uh, this kind of spectroscopy, and uh, the others are quite similar. Um, so the real applications and the small scale can be uh, done by different uh, holders and linked with different applications, uh, like uh, what we describe of the electronics, including solar cells, uh, uh, photocurrent sensors, um, and batteries, including lithium, sodium, potassium uh, batteries, and then some flexible, uh, electronics or optical electronics because we can deform those nanowires or nano sheets. Uh, so the first example, uh, I'll start with the gen germanium silicon core shell nanowire. Uh, so this was uh, done by two models. I imagine the electrical performance by the STM model, while the mechanical properties by the FM models. Uh, so you can get the stress and strain um, by the tensile test. Um, and the, the de details of how to establish this contact is first you need to um, place the nanowire onto the probe um, on the STM folder, for example, and then you can retract that nanowire and then load it onto the AFM holder and then you approach it onto the cantilever. 
and then you use uh, um, carbon uh, contamination actually. We attract carbon contamination into the area where uh, the nano wire and the uh, cantilever joints. Um, and then if we establish a relatively very strong uh, con connection, and then we can take the load onto the nano wire to uh, test uh, the tensile stress and strength. And then we can uh, do some observations and uh, the uh, and the uh, try to break it uh, because this wire is relatively thin. It's around uh, fifteen to twenty nanometers, so we can break it. In some cases, if I have done some collaborations to do research on relatively thick nanowires. Uh, more than 200 nanometers, and then because it's too thick, we cannot break it. But if it's thin, um, can deliver uh, is suitable, then we can break it and uh, test how, uh, how much strain it breaks, and then we can calculate the uh, um, mechanical properties. Show you some videos before you get bored. Uh, I have also done some uh, bending information onto this material. Uh, it, on the left side of the video, it's uh, six times thick, which shows you how precise the piezo, pro, uh, piezo tube can be. Um, just click it slowly, uh, and it moves at the sub nanometer scale and it can bend on a wire to a, a very small diameter of pen. And uh, in the end, still I cannot uh, break it in this case. Can I ask, yep, you, yes. are you just using beam shift to keep that centered, or sometimes do you need to use the goniometer? Uh, I use beam shift, yeah. Okay. yeah. But in this case, I believe it's quite stable because I um, this is not sensitive material on carbon grid, uh, so it, it's usually quite stable in this case. And uh, but usually I uh, my probe usually moves faster, and in this case I can actually break it. Of course, this is not an ideal bending. It's like a push and move in in a non ideal way. You know, in of course we know that uh, in some uh, holders like Tesla, we can do very parallel in a, on the zone axis or somehow, but in this case, it's a, I push it a little bit and to make good contact and tear it um, a little bit back and going down. So it's not ideal, but it's some kind of uh, breaking the uh, nano wire uh, by bending it. And uh, uh, at high resolution, we can also uh, observe the um, buffersation of the nano wire, which uh, has been reported uh, before this paper uh, on pure silicon nano wire. Uh, but in this case, I also observe it, uh, this quotient nano wire as well. Uh, it's the homomorphization of the silicon which I did some analysis on the uh, uh, faster Fourier transform uh, FFT images to uh, confirm the amortization actually happens on the quotient nanowire when the nanowire is under stress. So, so, so oh, yes. single crystal. Is that single crystal? Uh, yes, mostly single crystal. Yeah, mostly single crystal. If, if you uh, locate on a single nano wire.
Um, then I'll start to talk about uh, optical holder. Uh, this is uh, an optical holder that I previously have in Japan. Uh, on the right side is the pair was two and the cap on it, and the optical fiber going through the hole uh, to point in onto the sample. Uh, the green area is where the electron beam can, can be. Go the wires on the left to uh, host the sample. And I drilled a hole on the um, on the holder on the cap to apply a probe uh, and in a shape to align with the center of the fiber as well. Uh, and then when the probe is moving, the optical fiber and the probe together is pointing at the center. The probe is a little bit ahead of the fiber, so it means that when the probe is um, uh, contacting with the, the sample, then the optical fiber is also illuminating on that area. Uh, there was a very um, uh, th there was a problem about the signal, the noise to signal was very high. Uh, signal to noise is very low. Um, then uh, I try to uh, solve this question by uh, deploying a lock in amplifier. So to deploy a lock in amplifier, we need to code the signal which is shining onto the material. So we can use a chopper to chop the continuous light. And this light will then be coded into that path modulator. And then the sample will respond to the light, for example, could generate a photocurrent. And then the photocurrent is also chopped in the same frequency modulator. And then we can resolve that by a lot of the fire that we can resolve a, a signal from the sample. Which is relatively small. Uh, so the setup to test, for example, a wire in the system is uh, I usually use two setups. One setup is the straightforward one that we shine continuous light onto the material, uh, which is, for example, setup one. Uh, we can use laser diode, we can use LED. Uh, later on, I use LED because I don't require uh, coherency, and LED is cheaper and provides uh, quite good uh, uh, intensity to the material and more choices uh, than both applying lasers or LEDs. Um, this goes through the video profile to shine on the gunmetal wire. Uh, the other setup is like for that side, if, I, uh, if the intensity of light is very low, uh, for example, it's from a uh, light source using a light bulb and a monochromator, and that light intensity going out from the fiber can be uh, microwatts from 10 microwatts to 50 microwatts. It's a very low number. Some, some of them. Are even lower than 10 microwatts. It can be this from 200 nanometers to 400 nanometers per band. Um, the light bulb uh, keeps very low intensity. And then we have to uh, rely on the blocking of the fire for that signal. Uh, while for the laser uh, and um, LEDs, they can be uh, milliwatts, like 10 milliwatts, 20 milliwatts, or even more. If the optical fiber does not melt, then you can apply as much as uh, you can. But the gel engineers, they they said they don't want high uh, light energy to be placed into, into the pole piece because they said it may affect the imaging by introducing, you know, light are electromagnetic waves. So they may affect the imaging. But currently, I haven't noticed uh, this effect. Um, by applying this 
uh, two kind of setups. We can uh, measure the uh, IV curves and uh, follow current spectroscopy of the samples uh, with different um, bending ratios. So this is 0 0.081 is actually non-bending. That, that is caused by the contact. So I want to make firm contact rather than uh, a very loose contact. And yesterday, Sochan also asked oh, Sherry, Sherry asked me about uh, how do you make sure that the, the contact is reliable and that is a very good question and it's all, uh, always asked by the uh, reviewers um, that uh, if you look at the IV curves they are relatively straight it's it means that the contact is relatively good uh, the contact resistance it occurs when you see the sign of short short gate contact that uh, around zero there's a barrier, unless it's, let, let's say, for example, it's uh, almost zero until 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.5 volts, then it means there's some barrier uh, between uh, the contact. Either it's from the gold with the wire, which might be loose as well, or the probe and the sample. And it, it also depends on the material itself as well. Uh, sometimes you may use the tungsten probe, uh, which is uh, having very high uh, work function, but you can also try to use gold. Uh, if that doesn't work, then um, maybe the sample is not suitable in our probing system. Um, so two kinds of probes, usually it's just the tungsten probe and gold. Um, and by testing the IP curve, we can uh, check if the contact resistance is suitable uh, for our experiment. And once it's established, then we can uh, shine a light on it to test the photo color of the material. Uh, and while we are doing the electrical measurements, we always uh, turn off the electron beam. There are a few ways as well, I was asked about this. So we can, um, of course, you turn off the beam well, and there's no beam, or you can apply a CLA4 and then shift it away, and the beam those should be minimal um, to the sample if you shift it very far, uh, far away the CLA4. Uh, and now we have the beam shutter, so it's even more easy. I just click blank beam, and then the shutter is closed. Uh, and there's no shake from the valve, so it's quite stable. So that's the good function of our new microscope. Uh, and then uh, these are the photocurrent spectroscopy of the samples. Uh, that was resolved by the uh, blocking of the wire. And the wavelengths are realized by the monochromator uh, attached to a uh, uh, light bulb. It's a tunable light source. Um, and then in this case, for cadmium sulfide on a wire, it, uh, redshift is observed when the wire is deformed. Uh, and if you see here, actually, uh, you can see a lot of nano wires. They are, uh, it's a bad example, actually. Uh, I attached too much sample um, to the gold wire, which uh, I, I have talked about in the um, demo session. Okay, the next example is about uh, a probing technique. Uh, to make an actual nano wire junction. This is actually my favorite work. Although it's not published in a very good journal at that time, I was just uh, hurry to publish it. Uh, but I like this uh, work because I made a actual nano wire junction uh, between a silicon nano wire, which is relatively thin, and a cadmium sulfide nano wire, which I successfully used at that time. Um, I first take out a cadmium sulfide on a wire by uh, some weld welding uh, between the probe and 
the mechanic himself, I don't know why uh, I focus on game with relatively low levels. I usually use small four or small five um, to attract some contamination, and then it's uh, it's welded together, and then I retract the another wire, and then I replace the goats goat sample. I take it out. I replace gold wire with new uh, gold wire with the silicon lot of wires. Then I approach the cannon cell by the wire to attach with the silicon. And the contact, the initial contact was not very good. Um, and then I applied a very strong beam. Uh, although these two materials are not beam sensitive mat materials, I apply very strong beam to uh, improve the contact um, because when you apply very strong beam to the uh, contamination or amorphous carbon are gone by a very strong beam. I should have put a high resolution image here. But it's quite interesting. I uh, so managed to contact two parts together to make an actual non wire junction and then test the photo current um, of the uh, junction. And I observed uh, an interesting uh, phenomenon, which is the car photo current will be saturated uh, at relatively uh, at, at higher voltages. And uh, they are linked with the uh, light intensity power. Which is quite interesting. I I believe this is uh, linked with the junction probability. Um, and the other case of optical holder is to test the cathodal luminescence. Uh, this was done uh, together with the Kratzu uh, OBU, and um, in this case, we don't have to attach the. Uh, probe um, to the cap. What we care about is the light information that we can collect from the fiber. Uh, of course, the fiber um, collection ability is limited because the fiber core we used was about, I think, 200, not, uh, 200 microns. 200 microns in this case. Sometimes I use 100, sometimes 200. The thickness of the hole is 250, so 200 microns is the maximum I can go. Um, so the area of collection uh, is quite small. Um, but still, uh, we managed to get the uh, ethylene essence um, and the mapping of the heading cell pipe. And that was the only successful case we had. Uh, it's only my head itself that works. Uh, the chairs that are very well, maybe due to low efficiency, uh, low value efficiency. And um, this is a good product I, I, I know from actually Gatan. Uh, when I was in conference, uh, some groups they have uh, got good results from the Gatan Vulcan holder because they have some kind of mirror up and down so to collect uh, more light because you understand the materials will emit light in different directions rather than coherent. Uh, so mirrors can uh, largely improve the collection efficiency. Uh, but in all setup, it also works but on limited materials. Uh, so this is an example of our holder in QT. Uh, that the light is coming from from the side rather than going through the hole in the middle. So you'll see the blue light is shining onto the material. Uh, I have been asked a lot um, by um, some groups, they, uh, for example, in ESU, they illuminate the sample through the objective uh, um, port. Uh, they take out the objective. Uh, uh, 
it's an optical fiber to shine onto the uh, grid, but they are not sure if the sample is illuminated or not uh, because they cannot see it sealed. And when they when they are doing a uh, catalysis experiment, the chemical reaction doesn't happen. That's uh, how you confirm light is illuminating on the sample or not. Is it because light is not there? Uh, in your case, we can see it. Let's take out the holder and uh, on the table, which I the light, oh, it's on the, it's on the uh, sample. Uh, the fiber will be connected similarly like uh, what I have uh, discussed before. And then uh, in this case, it's an um, example on um, 2D material, which is uh, more deeply than diacinamide. Um, you know, once the material is there, you have different ways to probe it. So I try to probe it in two ways. One is pressing in that direction. And the other way to probe it is to um, push it from the side to make deformation. <laughs> so I call it bending deformation and aging deformation. Bending and aging deformation. Uh, of course, to theoretical guys, this again might not be very um, ideal, especially they are asking, oh, is it uh, aligning exactly to that direction? I would say maybe. <laughs> so if, if someone is um, criticizing on that, then how to improve this experiment is in you probably need a double tilt STM holder. In your case, we have single tilt. I can tilt on Z uh, X axis. Sometimes I can tilt in a good direction, but still I cannot guarantee it's on its own axis because uh, the Y direction I cannot tilt. Um, and then uh, I can measure the uh, for the current spectroscopy and the response um, in by different uh, deformation methods and on the left to do one uh, left to uh, diagrams are about the uh, uh, bending deformation to whether it's dark or light condition and it's deformed or not deformed and some of them are tested uh, uh, more and then the uh, photo current with re regard to time to uh, show you the response. Uh, each data point gap is uh, 0 0.025 seconds, so it's 25 milliseconds. Um, so you can see that the response uh, are showing differently when it's um, bending deformation, uh, it shows the contact is more reliable. Like, like what I said, re reliability of the contact is quite important. And apparently, if you touch this way in bending, the contact area is higher and the contact is more, more firm. While for aging deformation, you touch it from the side and the contact is less stable. In this case, I can catch up on noise uh, signal there. And while bending the um, the sample uh, by bending information, uh, it shows a gradual increase of the current and then it covers where the bending is released, which is quite interesting. Um, while for the uh, noisy one, the aging deformation, uh, we cannot draw a very clear conclusion whether the bending will, uh, will change the conductivity. Uh, the spectroscopy also shows that the um, bending deformation will not change the um, band structure of the material, while for the aging deformation would uh, there's some of the changes to the photocarbon spectroscopy, which is related to uh, 
the cutoff wavelength and the band gap of the material. All right. Um, more examples then uh, goes to the energy examples, particularly the anode studies of lithium ion batteries, sodium ion batteries, and uh, potassium ion batteries. And um, for example, this is uh, some tin oxide particles um, were thin. And on the right side, this is uh, lithium, of course, oxidized the lithium. Uh, apply lithium to the, the microscope, and when you are doing the insertion, there's some air already in the microscope room. So there's some lithium oxide to be as a solid electrolyte. And then this tin uh, oxide can be uh, mediated. Um, and uh, we want to observe the King oxide uh, is using the space uh, desired. If it's too much tin oxide, then the sample may crack because too much, and the uh, tin oxide may um, expand and shrink and crack by itself. But if the tin oxide is not enough, then the property is not, not good enough. Uh, another set, uh, example is um, sodium ion battery. And in this case, it's uh, uh, similar. Just uh, change the lithium into sodium. And sodium oxide is also naturally formed there. And the um, experiment is quite similar. So I just uh, give you a little bit faster. And potassium ion batteries as well, just change the sodium to potassium. And then to get some uh, uh, data, including the uh, uh, diffraction patterns and uh, high resolution images. All right, uh, a short conclusion for the Institute probing for anode study is that we can observe the volume expansion uh, in GEM quite clearly. Uh, we can observe the crystallography changes, and I mostly rely on the diffractions, which is more accurate than a uh, small area uh, high resolution. And uh, we can also uh, apply biasing to uh, lithiate the sample or delithiate the sample. Okay. Um, so this is another example uh, of 2D uh, optoelectronics. Previous or uh, just uh, 1D, uh, we can also uh, manipulate the 2D structure and um, test the photocurrent uh, spectroscopy and the photoresponse of the material uh, of a few layered uh, black phosphorus uh, lava sheets. So uh, I would like to uh, make a conclusion for probing holder would suitable to your application or not. Um, so chip holder is quite good. It's stable, it's supported uh, by a grid or by a chip. Uh, it, it can provide multiple uh, electrodes, terminals, uh, which requires chip design and manufacture. Uh, but um, probing holders, uh, it's freestanding. So there's no carbon support or window uh, really not cheap. Um, but the limitation on terminal is only two. So one from sample side of wire, one from the probe. And if the reviewer said, oh, when you are measuring IV curve, you need four terminals. Sorry, you cannot provide four terminals. So if you want more terminals, go to SEM or uh, design a good chip and place your sample correctly there. That would be the choice uh, if it's new terminal contact. Uh, so more experience on uh, the contact will be required. Uh, so we don't need chips, and uh, samples are on both wire or uh, tungsten probe, half grade or high grade. Um, 
and contact are established by probe, which means we have more flexibility. And probe can supply chemical, for example, lithium or sodium. For example, if we want to contact 100 or 110 for sets, uh, we can do that. Uh, this is an example on um, uh, highlight profs guide, uh, an organic one, so not high uh, sensitive, but still sensitive. I can contact um, to the uh, 001 or 100 or can uh, the 110 so to test the properties on different uh, places. So frequently asked questions about uh, our research is, uh, can we apply a uh, light gas liquid and multiple electrodes at the same time? I was asked yesterday as well. Uh, currently it's quite tricky unless first you want the light to be supplied through the TEM and maybe gas through the ETEM and then you can put in some uh, special holder with special chip and maybe it's possible, it's doable, I think. Uh, and the multiple electrodes uh, on, um, on holders is also approachable by a special uh, chip. And uh, biomedical organic samples, actually we are currently doing a lot of polymers currently now in QT, uh, so it's, uh, durable um, thanks to uh, the development of the um, uh, microscopes and sensors. And can the uh, probing holder to be moved onto the other microscopes as collaboration, for example? Uh, so it's not just the holder, but with some boxes. So if it's required, we need to move both the holder and the controllers. Uh, and um, bulky samples, we need um, some uh, treatment to be placed to the samples. All right, limitations, you already know that. So um, thank you for your attentions. And um, as we already run out of time, do we um, introduce or? Time, you know, we can um, move on, I guess. I don't know, we can, we can have another. Question later yeah. during discussion time. Yeah. Think yeah. How much time will do that. Okay. Um, so you might be quite interested to know, oh, you only have one probe. Uh you we can already do something. Um if you're not satisfied with one probe and you desire one more probe to see what uh Carl Motosan can do, uh we'd like to warmly welcome uh, uh Carl Motosan of uh, who is the principal researcher in uh, National Institute for Material Science in Japan, um, who is very famous to um, to detect the local temperatures at a nanometer, nanometer scale. We want the local temperature rather than the thermocoupler reading um, of your whole chip, but you want the exact temperature of an exact place. Um, uh, Carl Monosan is the best person in the world to do this. Uh, thank you, a uh, very kind uh, uh, introduction, uh, Zansan. Uh, oh, my name is Kawamoto from Nimes, uh, Japan. Uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to introduce our research this time. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about the nanoscale thermal transport measurement in a TM. Uh, I'm a uh, my, my boss was uh, uh, Professor Goldberg in, in Nemus, but then he, 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 he is now a QUT's professor. And now I'm a, a member of uh, another uh, microscopy group, uh, Kimo, Dr. Kimoto's group, and uh, I'm a member of the Center for Basic Research of Materials in Nemus. Uh, okay, uh, this is uh, the outline of this presentation. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce the background of this study, and uh, I'd like to introduce our developing uh, STEM-based thermal analytical microscopy. Uh, we call this uh, STAM and uh, its applications. Uh, at the end, I would like to introduce a recent study about the development of temperature control system for STAM. Okay, let me introduce the background and highly about the highly desired nanoscale thermal measurements. 
Uh, as you know, uh, electrical circuits for de these devices are miniaturized to nanoscale. Uh, in order to develop more advanced uh, devices, we need precise heat flow controls. Uh, therefore, uh, funnel engineering uh, becomes more important. In fact, the Japanese government uh, set a strategic target about funnel engineering like this. Uh, especially, it is very important to develop uh, a new observation method for nanoscale thermal phenomena. Uh, for example, it is expected for both of heat dissipation and heat insulation materials to improve them by controlling nanostructures. Uh, this is a schematic isolation of heat sink composite, which is important as heat dissipation material. As you can see, uh, heat sink composite consists, uh, consists of uh, thermal conductive fillers uh, and curing thermally insulating epoxy resin. In order to design more higher thermal conductive heat sink com composites, it is required to understand uh, complicated heat pathways and measure to measure thermal resistance in a local area, uh, such as uh, boundaries uh, between nanoscale fillers and uh, a filler itself. Uh, on the other hand, in order to improve high figure of merit ZT of thermal electric materials, uh, we need to decrease the thermal conductivity uh, by introducing nanostructures such as a voice, uh, grain boundaries, uh, roughness of a boundary between a substrate and uh, uh, thermoelectric films, which scatter phonons. Therefore, it is very important to develop an observation method of phonon scattering at the nanoscale. Now here is expected specifications for such nanoscale uh, thermal conductivity measurements, uh, which are uh, high spatial resolution at the nanoscale, a high temperature resolution uh, 10 to the power of minus one Kelvin at least, uh, capability of supplying the heat into desired portion and the quick measurements uh, without the specimen damage. To realize these specifications for practical nanoscale thermal measurements, a focused electron beam is one of the best heat source because we can focus an electron beam at nanoscale and also we can freely change the heating position by using the stem mode. Uh, then uh, we have promoted to develop the, the stem-based thermal analytical microscopy uh, using a focused electron beam as a heat source. Uh, okay, let me explain the dissipated power of focused electron beam radiation. Uh, in, in elastic scattering, uh, plasma energy loss is mainly converted to heat. As you can see, in this schematic illustration, <clears throat> here is a TM microgrid uh, with a uniform uh, supporting thin film. Uh, now, our focused electron beam is irradiated with a constant current density and uh, the diameter of R0 uh, uh, on, the, on this thin film. Uh, this is a supporting grid. Uh, in this case, a dissipated power uh, can be expressed by this equation. Uh, this uh, is uh, the diameter of electron beam. Uh, this is current density of electron beam, uh, elemental charge, uh, plasma energy loss, and uh, plasma mean free path, and uh, T is the thickness of the specimen. In this case, uh, this is a thin film, so uh, thickness. So, uh, and uh, these delta E and the lambda depends on substances of a film uh, specimen. So this dissipated power uh, depends on materials and the thickness. Okay, uh, this is our TM, JEM 3100 FEF transmission electron microscope. Uh, here is a field emission gun and the accelerating voltage is about uh, is a 300 kilovolt. 
In addition to microstructure observation, uh, we can carry out the physical property measurements of nanomaterials by using these in situ TM holders. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we can introduce a single movable, movable electrode uh, for electron, electrical measurements into small uh, space between pole pieces uh, by using a piezo uh, controlled holder. Um, uh, uh, Moreover, uh, we can we could uh, we can perform mechanical and optical measurements by using these uh, special holders as Zansan uh, in introduced. And as you can see here is uh, this is a, a pole piece uh, of TM. Uh, as you can see, the gap is only two millimeters. Here, this is a very small uh, space. Uh, we needed to insert a specimen in this small gap, and we needed to measure very uh, uh, measure the uh, physical property by using the probing techniques in this small area. Uh, in addition to these physical property measurements, uh, we have promoted to develop a nanoscale temperature measurement method using this two two probe holder for assembling a nanothermal couple in TM. Uh, this picture shows the top part of this holder uh, by using a piezo driven mechanics. Uh, these copper hearts one and two can be independently and three dimensionally controlled in, in TM. Uh, sharpened tips can be fixed on, the e on each copper heart uh, like this. And uh, uh, here is uh, uh, extra fixed uh, terminals. Uh, specimen can be attached with them uh, by uh, in, in, uh, 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 we can use also use uh, uh, some attachment for uh, fixing the specimen uh, and by using this holder we can make a contact between sharpened tips and the specimen in TM. In order to insert thermocouple tips into TM, we needed to choose non-magnetic materials uh, because, uh, as you know, uh, the uh, specimen position is subjected to very high magnetic field of two tesla in no uh, conventional uh, objective lens, except uh, Lorentz lens. So. Uh, uh, we we, we cho choose uh, no magnetic materials, and in addition, uh, the no nano thermocouple also requires small diameters for high spatial resolution uh, measurement. At first, we prepare the sharpened tips of a, a copper nickel alloy called the constanta and the pure copper as a pair of nano thermocouple by electrochemical etching method. But as you can see in this uh, TM image, the kappa, ah, sorry, this, uh, uh, but as you can see, uh, the kappa is not shiny. Uh, this means the surface of the tip has roughness. Actually, the diameter of the sharpened tip uh, uh, was uh, over uh, 300 nanometers. Uh, to decrease the diameter, uh, we examined the electrochemical etching conditions and the thermocouple materials. Uh, finally, as shown in this high resolution TM image, the smallest diameter in 10 nanometers of contact could be achieved with high repeatability. Uh, in order to carry out a nanoscale thermal transport measurement in TM, we developed a stem based thermal analytical microscopy STAM. Uh, by combining heat input uh, by stem beam with the temperature measurement method uh, uh, by assembling non-thumb couple in TM. As shown in this demonstration, <coughs> we can uh, make a physical contact between specimen and the thumb couple. Uh, we can monitor local temperature uh, change up to this point M. Uh, uh, for, exam uh, uh, for example, uh, constant heat input into 
uh, this point, red point I, uh, the heat passed through this specimen and uh, is out of specimen from uh, position uh, measuring point M to met metallic thermocouple because the, the thermocouple works as a heat sink. Uh, this figure shows a time dependence of a measured voltage uh, in the case of heating the point I, uh, voltage well, is instantaneously increased up to 17 microvolt, uh, the generated thermal electromotive force uh, can be converted to temperature change of 0.25 Kelvin using Zebec coefficient of thermocouple. Uh, this means uh, changing uh, such a, a small uh, specimen in micrometer scale uh, to steady heat conduction state is very quick uh, in mi millisecond or microsecond. <clears throat> Hence, uh, the heat conduction equation at a steady state can be utilized uh, in this uh, schematic illustration. Uh, thermocouple is physically contact, phys in physical contact with a simple one-dimensional model specimen. Uh, how does the measured temperature change as the position of heat input by electron beam is adjusted? Uh, in this case, based on the heat conduction equation, uh, that considers the heat absorbed by electron beam, uh, the temperature uh, measured by the thermocouple, which is in physical contact with the specimen, can be exp expressed by this equation. While the amount of heat absorption depends on the type of material and the thickness of a specimen, if the material of a specimen is uniform and the thickness remains constant, uh, the measured temperature uh, varies linearly uh, uh, like this. Uh, in other words, uh, heating the thermocouple, uh, heating the uh, thermocouple near the, uh, he heating the specimen and near the uh, temperature measurement point causes the most significant temperature change, uh, whereas uh, heating it further away uh, leads to a uh, decrease in temperature uh, due to uh, thermal resistance as heat pass, passes through the specimen. So on the basis of Fourier's law, uh, we can uh, obtain information about the thermal conductivity in local area by measuring the temperature a gradient of desired portion in, uh, in specimen uh, by changing the heating position. <clears throat> okay, let me show you an applications of STAM measurement about at first I'd, I'd like to uh, show you a high uh, a heat pathway analysis in composite. Uh, this is a uh, setup for two-dimensional stem measurement of heat sink composite, as you can see in this schematic illustration, and uniform thinned spe specimen consisting of uh, uh, aluminum oxide fillers uh, cured in epoxy resin is supported by tungsten base via thermally insulating epoxy. Uh, and now thermocouple is uh, physically attached with the specimen at the point M uh, by scanning uh, focused electron beam irradiation under stem mode. Specimen can be heated by scanning function by using a scanning function. Uh, input heat uh, to specimen is conducted through the specimen and out of specimen from the point M. Uh, this is a bright field TM image of heat sink compo composite specimen uh, in this uh, 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 dotted area. Uh, this is a STAM image acquired in the same area. Uh, this STAM image could be acquired in 90 minutes at the beginning of this study. Uh, as you can see in this TM 
image, a lot of thermal conductive fillers, uh, such as uh, A, B, C, as shown in uh, gray contrast, uh, are cured in thermally insulating uh, epoxy, uh, shown in uh, or, uh, white, white contrast, uh, are cured in uh, 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 a bit between uh, largest fillers one and two, like this. Now, some couple is physically connected with filler one. Uh, this stamp image uh, <clears throat> is painted on the basis of this color bar. The color the colors correspond to the temperature increase of the thermal couple uh, from room temperature to maximum temperature increase of thermal couple. The pillar one uh, is shown in black and red colors like this. Uh, this means that uh, heating the pillar one makes the large, largest uh, temperature change of uh, uh, physically uh, contacting uh, non-thermal couple. On the other hand, in the filler two, uh, far away from uh, far away from thermal couple, the color is uh, painted uh, in sky blue, showing a small temperature uh, change of thermal couple. Uh, this means that uh, phonon generated in filler two are scattered on the pathways from Fila two to Fila one. Uh, now let, let's uh, focus on this uh, uh, red dotted area. Uh, these are uh, ma the magnified TM and the STAM images. Uh, in this area, uh, as you can see, the large uh, Fila two and small Fila C and the very small uh, Fila D are neighboring like this. And you can see on other uh, fillers E and F. Uh, as you can see, the area uh, around uh, TD uh, near the filler D uh, is painted in black color. Uh, this result means that uh, input heat to the area uh, around the, the point TD makes a temperature increase the, of some couple larger than heating other uh, areas such as the point TF near FIRA F in, uh, in FIRA uh, 2. Therefore, this result implies that uh, in input heat into FIRA 2 is conducted uh, to measuring point M uh, through the <coughs> FIRAs D and C not through the fillers F, E, C. So in this way, a thermal anal analysis enabling the fillers with these heat pathways in, com in composite like this. So today we have uh, Ingemar with us. And then so um, Ingemar is um, expert in, or our speakers are experts in, in, uh, in situ TM, and then he specializes in gas solid interactions, more in catalyst applications. And so following our discussions yesterday, we cover, um, I think, um, a little bit our sample preparation. So um, I hope we have more questions today. Now you have here lots of very nice talks. Um, yes. Do you have any questions? And please either type in or just speak up, please. And then while you are thinking about your questions and typing, perhaps I can ask Ingemar a question here. So. Um, I want to ask more um, nanoparticle catalysis implications. So I think in catalysis in particular, people are interested in, for example, Ogrando. They are hoping to be able to, not just to measure the particle shape changes and associated with the properties, for example, selectivities and activities. Yep. And then they used, in, for example, um, TDA to help uh, to do the analysis. Do you have any comments on this and what's the challenges and difficulties? Uh, yeah. So. Um... Yeah, with TEM, yeah. it's very common to do before analysis. So you, you confirm your synthesis of your particles. 
And then uh, in uh, some cases, uh, that's actually what you would hope, but then there is also some kind of characteristic after uh, catalytic performance tests are made. So you see what has happened with the sample after. Uh, so the, the thing with in situ, for example, gas reaction is that you see what is happening as well with this during the reaction, which uh, there are other techniques that can do as well. But when you go down to nanoparticles, there are very few techniques that can resolve what is actually happening on a small scale. Yeah. Um, so uh, the most common technique that people use is uh, X-ray absorption, spectroscopy X access, uh, and um, the Fourier transform uh, analysis uh, technique, uh, XAPS, to kind of get the information on bond distances changing uh, chemical coordination. Uh, but this is, uh, this is very challenging when you go down below a few nanometer size particles. Uh, and current state of the art is around between two to five nanometers. So this is why TEM like fills a gap uh, in the current state of the art catalysts. Yes. Um, yeah. So I think maybe this, do you think is a pathway, for example, because in more larger sample quantities, for example, in X, I guess you mentioned, it's probably more likely they can achieve measuring, for example, the, the uh, output of the gas. I'm not quite familiar with this. Do you think they have achieved that already? And that be correlated yeah, yeah. with TEM in some yes. way. I think, yeah. I think yeah, especially for model systems, when you right. use a large mm -hmm. sub substrate and yes. then, uh, reasonably large particles, then, right. uh, mm -hmm. then you can uh, definitely use uh, access very... And can the same thing apply to electrocatalysis? I think a lot of people are interested in when it's done in liquid. I think yep. in XAS, it can be done relatively easier compared to in TEM. It's, it's easier to make uh, the cells, mm -hmm. um, uh, but the, um, there are, I'm not an expert on the XAPs. Yeah, so yeah. I was just thinking, that, trying yeah. to relay the challenges. Yeah, and, yeah uh, but you know. typically the challenges is, is mm -hmm. the way you uh, analyze the uh, uh, the data and the way you acquire the reflected information or transmission information. Mm -hmm. So for, with the cells, you have to do fluorescent mode, for example. Yep. Otherwise, you get too much noise. Yes. Uh, and this is um, challenging when you want to do uh, 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 smaller particles. With EM, you, you, you don't have the problem with smaller particles. It's more about sample prep in itself. Mm. Uh, so it's different things you have to battle with. Yes. So um, do you have any tips or suggestions? How do you, for example, check your samples and particles in preparation? What are the care you normally would do before your experiment? Uh, yeah. So um, you do the, not the normal before and after, of course, yep. and, and see what you have. And then um, yeah, you kind of slowly have to go through the, the during uh, gas reaction because you don't really know what will happen. So yes, it's yeah. very difficult to come from a theoretical standpoint and work on some kind of, this is what's going to happen. This is how I set up my measurements. It's like, you see what happens and mm. then you will design your, your experiment after. Usually it's very interesting dynamics that has never been done or reported before. So before I ask you another question, I think they have a question from Lucy about suggestion for preparing film samples. They are not completely flat. So after focus ion beam can lead to blurry images because they are not completely flat. And so atomic planes are not perfectly aligned over large depth. Okay. So, so this is a very good question. Uh, and it's a big problem, especially with the MEMS ship uh, kind of cell that we use because that's um, membrane that is very thin, that buckles when you um, flow gases. And uh, you have to attach your sample on one of these membranes, which has a transparent window, 
and then putting something on the edge uh, and then extending over the window. As this starts to buckle, it can uh, change geometry and it's very difficult to follow the alignments. Uh, so you kind of have to set up your experiment so that you know the temperature and flow you're going to use, uh, and then you align your sample. Uh, and then hope you, you can stay at this flow and change the gas composition until you get your reaction uh, condition set. So, yes, Lucy, I hope that answered your question. So I think there's another question that has been answered, I think, by the speaker. So another question is about for nano contact. I think that's a previous question already answered yes. after the talk, isn't it? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, do we have any other questions from the online audience? Um, so if not, I think I'll ask one more question and then we conclude here. I think one key thing in doing in situ is to study the dynamics. And so the rate of dynamics is very important for us to know how fast we need to capture our in situ data. And how do you think about this problem? For example, you mentioned that when you do preparation, you always do before and after. So you probably do an ex situ experiment and yeah. then to figure out how fast this reaction happens. And then, so how would you, um, maybe there are some more beginner audience, um, tell our audience how you think about this problem and how, do you, how would you design your experiment so you can figure out what kind of dynamic rate, basically how fast you need to capture your data, you set up your residual experiment. Uh, this is also something here yeah, that there is no information to begin off. Uh, so you, you have to see what's happening. And mm. usually you begin with normal condition, imaging condition modes, like you take it frame second, maybe. Right. And then you see uh, the next second, you do time series, and you see what happens with uh, your particles. And hopefully you have a direct electron detector that can run very fast uh, imaging series. Uh, and then you can go down. Uh, in as low dose as possible and start very low and then increase highly uh, slowly until you see some kind of change in the dynamics. Because then you know this is those uh, affected dynamics. And then you kind of find a region where it's uh, seem to be only reaction. Right. Uh, yeah. Determined rates. So if I can make a short summary, so a typical experiment, you start with ex situ to looking at your particles or catalysts before and after reaction first. And then probably, then you say you'll um, investigate the um, time series. And this is all done um, basically not in a gas environment. Yeah. And then once you figure out dynamics, roughly how fast it might happen, and then you start flowing gas and then to see if your estimate is correct then you set up a real experiment to observe the whole phenomenon. Yeah. Is that some, Something like that. me like that, yes. the workflow? It's very different from depending on what kind of catalytic. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I think that's a very good advice to our audience because say, very hard to estimate the dynamics from the entirely ex situ yeah. or the, the bulk analysis, the reaction results. How fast it happened can really translate to the atomic level of changes we want, we want to know. Yeah. So I think that hopefully give you some ideas about the time and then also thinking you need to invest behind the thing about when you see this beautiful data in a paper and the presentation and they show these amazing changes in catalysts, what's all the uh, steps behind the thing that you need to do to prepare so then you can capture the phenomenon you're interested. Do we have more questions? If not, then we have a break and I believe the next talk starts at 11 o'clock. So see you soon and thanks, Ingemar. I will. <laughs> um, next speaker is Liam Spillen from um, Gatan Amatech and he's going to talk about in situ spectroscopy analysis of inorganic nanomaterials. Thank you, Liam. Thanks very much. Oh, you want video? My God, so much technology. It's not on Zoom anymore, I'm on there. 
So we good? good. Right. Okay. So I will get going with my presentation. So thanks for the introduction. Um, so just for the people online who probably haven't seen me yet, uh, my name's Liam Spillane. I'm an analytical application scientist based out of uh, the Gatan office, which is in Pleasanton, California. And the product area that I kind of work in is what we call analytical. So anything that relates to our kind of spectrometer product line, so GIFs and kind of energy filters and such things. So I'm going to be talking about in-situ eels and in-situ eel spectrum imaging primarily. So just, I'm sure we've kind of seen some slides like this before, but just as an uh, introduction, like why do we capture data continuously? So what's the point in doing in situ experiments? So this is quite a nice example from um, molecular material that has like molybdenum and sulfur in it. It was an F-time experiment. So what you're looking at on the left is the kind of the initial state of this material. And on the right is a final state. So this was a heating experiment that uh, was performed like from room temperature up to 1200 Celsius. It's energy filtered imaging in a low loss regime with a quite a narrow slit. So it's F10 with a K2 camera on a GIF quantum. So this was an in situ experiment. If we run the time series in the imaging, you can see like there's a whole, whole kind of wealth of things that are going on in between this image that we have at the beginning and this image at the end. So if we didn't do an in situ experiment, we just did a before and after, we're gonna miss all of this information. Um, yeah, essentially, we're going to not get the full story of the reaction. So it's kind of important to do things in situ, see things as they happen, and give us the full kind of picture of reactions and things that we want to track. So that's the motivation. Um, kind of just uh, where does Gatan sit in, in situ ecosystems? So this has evolved quite a lot in recent years. So I think when I was a student, the only Gatan in situ product that I was aware of was probably a heating holder. So a furnace heating holder. Now we have like a whole bunch of like different pieces of hardware and software that allow you to do like a whole bunch of different experiments. So we can do imaging, um, TEM video, STEM video, like diffraction techniques, like 40 STEM, associated analysis techniques of 40 STEM, so strain mapping, DPC. Analytical techniques, so EELS, F10, and EDS. There are some holders. And then that's all um, kind of controlled with Digital Micrograph, which is the software package that we kind of control all our hardware with. So that's our ecosystem. Um, we are getting data with a GIF continuum, right? An in-situ GIF continuum. So where does the GIF continuum sit with respect to this kind of pretty array of hexagons? So the GIF continuum is pretty cool because it allows you to do like essentially all of these analytical techniques in a single platform. And that's kind of nice because you can do like a whole bunch of multimodal experiments as part of a single experiment, single microscopy session on the same sample, the same um, area. It's kind of very powerful. So yes, yeah, so the GIF Continuum IS, so the in-situ flavor, essentially it's a energy filter, a current generation. And we can do all of these um, acquisition modalities in a single hardware system. So there are like kind of three flavors of detector that we can have on the GIF continuum. I'm kind of going to step through what those are briefly. Uh, that, and then essentially all of those acquisition modalities you can do on all of those detectors. So the first flavor of detector is what we call a traditional like indirect detector. So it's a fiber coupled scintillator based camera. How does that work? You essentially have a scintillator and that performs electron to light conversion. That's bonded to a fiber optic um, kind of stack. And so then basically your light gets transferred through this fiber optic and uh, generally to a CCD, which is like the older technology or a CMOS sensor. So our electrons come in, convert to photons. We have some kind of scatter in the fiber optic and then we read that out at the sensor that's right at the end. 
what are the advantages and disadvantages of this type of detector? So advantages, they are linear over a very wide input range, broad KV support. So you can generally do low KV experiments, high KV experiments on the same camera, um, good point spread at low KV, and they're quite resistant to abuse and damage. They're also simple to operate. Limitations, so the main limitation are these guys have like noise. So we have read noise, phono and gain noise, and the point spread is like poorer at high KV. Okay, so that's a fiber couple scintillator. What do we have next? So kind of next in line, uh, this is kind of a newer camera. So a thresholding hybrid pixel direct detector. So this is kind of a uh, different type of direct detector. Okay, so this is like our stellar camera. So the, this is kind of quite different to what we saw with the fiber couple camera. So primary difference is you've got like a very, very big pixel. So you have, um, essentially we're doing direct detection. So the primary electron comes into a very thick silicon layer form electron hole pairs, that's bump bonded to some pixels that are in this ASIC chip. And these pixels are like physically large. So the pixels on the fiber coupled camera, I didn't, didn't specify, but on the, the GIF camera, we're looking at like 18 micron pixels. So that's the physical pixel size. These guys are like 55 to 150 microns for these types of cameras. So in the same kind of physical camera area, you're gonna have less of those pixels. So what's the advantage of the hybrid pixel camera? So it's a counting kind of camera. So we have near zero read noise. You can do like very fast readout and do multiple pass frame summing. Broad range of input counts. And yeah, essentially they have a very, very high dynamic range because that sensor is really thick. It can take quite a lot of current in a single pixel. Very sharp point spread at low KV. So these are like super optimized for something in the range, say like 30 to 80 KV for EOS. Limitations, as I said, they're physically large. So we can, we can have like less pixels in the kind of the area that we would have for the other camera. Uh, counts are summed in the camera. And these guys are not super optimized for high KV. So final camera, okay, so we have kind of three types. So we had our fiber coupled, our hybrid pixel camera, and now the final detector that we're gonna move on to is a counting monolithic direct detector. So this is the technology that the K3 essentially is based around. So you have uh, like active detector at each pixel. Uh, it's a transmission sensor, so it's really thin, like basically the beam will go through this through these pixels. So we don't stop the beam, we just kind of measure it in its part. So yeah, direct measurement at the pixel level. And these pixels are much smaller than the other two cameras. So we're looking at like five micron pixels instead of you know, tens of micron for the hybrid pixel. So what are the advantages of like a K3 type camera? Okay, so again, we're counting. And the, the real benefit of the, the counting is that we have zero read noise and we can do multiple pass frame summing, like high, high readout speeds. Centroiding and counting, so we get like really high DQE, and reduced alias noise. We're accessing every electron strike, so we basically get one count for one electron. Very sharp point spread at high KV, so these, these are gonna have like really high resolution performance at 200, 300 KV. Large format, that just means we have lots of pixels, which is useful. Limitations, so nonlinear at high count rate. So the dynamic range of this guy is gonna be a little lower than the hybrid pixel, for example. And then it's gonna give you worse performance at lower KV. So this type of camera is like gonna be really high performance at 200, 300 KV. And then it's not supported below 80 KV. Yeah, right, okay. So those are the three flavors of detector. Okay, so this is like one final slide in K3. So this is a nice example of the benefits that we get at the high KV, okay, with the, with the MAPS camera. So this is some, just an example spectrum from uh, lanthanum strontium iron cobalt oxide, 200 KV, like cold feg. So we did this in the office on our F200. And this is a low spectrometer dispersion, so 900 milliEV per channel. This gives us a really large energy range. 
So we've got three, four, five, six channels, nice easy number to remember. That gives us uh, an energy range of 3,100 EV. But with our cold FEG, we're going to get a single channel forward path max. So we're still like maintaining quite good energy resolution, even with this huge energy range. So yeah, so we can zoom in to kind of two different parts of the spectrum. So we're looking at some of the transition metal like L edges over here on the left. So iron, I think cobalt, and then probably an lanthanum an edge or something here. And you can see that these peaks are like ultra sharp, super sharp. And then one of the benefits of counting, okay, so it's very, very high sensitivity. So this is the same spectrum. If we go out to the strontium L edge out at like 1900 EV, you can see that we have like good quality spectra out here where we have much weaker signal. So that's in a single spectrum. Okay, so that is so the three cameras. So the system that we've been working on here, um, probably for the benefit of people online, uh, the data that we've been doing in the lab is all, all using a K3-based camera and an in-situ filter on the, the ARM300 downstairs. Okay, so back to our hexagons and what's kind of the focus that we're at, like kind of in the current generation software. So the big thing that we have added very recently is in-situ support for spectrum imaging. So 4D STEM is something you can do time series of now and then EEL spectrum imaging and EDS spectrum imaging. Okay, so our spectrum imaging techniques. Why is an electron counting detector particularly useful for these kind of experiments? Okay, so we compare like a traditional detector versus a counting detector. So the kind of the methodology when you're setting up an EEL spectrum with a traditional detector, you want to maximize the signal that you have in a single spectrum and you want to be above the noise floor. Essentially what you want to do is minimize the number of times that detector is read out. Otherwise you're going to sum lots of read noise and you just get kind of a, like a fixed pattern noise or something like that. With a counting detector, you don't have that, uh, you don't have that to worry about because we don't have readout noise. So we can just go as fast as we can. Um, this minimizes our delays. We can do everything nice and fast. Why is that beneficial for an in situ experiment? Essentially, it allows us to oversample in our temporal domain during data collection. And then we can kind of decide what time resolution or in situ resolution we want after the experiment. Um, so yeah, so if you're not sure the time resolution that you need, you can just oversample a bit. It also allows you to do things like drift correction and, and things like that much, much faster. So yeah, an accounting camera is like super, super beneficial for any, any in situ deals experiment, essentially. So what are the two flavors of experiment that I want to, I want to touch on? So essentially we've got a spectroscopy workflow and we have a spectrum image workflow. Okay, so how do they differ? In fact, they're quite similar. Um, first of all, in the software, there's usually an in-situ button somewhere. You just enable the in-situ button. Um, this is a spectroscopy workflow. So there's actually this, we didn't see this in the lab yesterday, but you can just choose like different data streams for an in-situ experiment. So with EELS, you can pair that with like EDS. You can prepare it with a STEM image. That's what we're looking at here. So we choose the signals that we want to record. And essentially they're just not synchronized. It's not like a spectrum image, but we can acquire them all simultaneously at the same time. Um, choose kind of the parameters for each one of those. So for the stem image that I've highlighted there, we just choose the dwell time, the pixel density, whether we want to use the focus loop, just kind of normal things, okay? We choose eels. We're going to decide whether we want to be in single range mode, dual mode, choose the view time, choose the energy loss choose the in situ stimuli, so set the in situ parameters up, and then you just hit record, okay? So you hit record and then like perform some action on the holder. And then when the experiment is done, you just press record again, the record will stop, and then you just have time series, time series data. So how does that work in practice? So this is an example from uh, Linus Group in Cornell. 
So what they're interested in is essentially fine structural changes in these complex oxides. So this is a super lattice of like STO and lead titanate. And they want to do titanium LNES kind of analysis in these different layers as they're heating. So what they did was they heat from 26 Celsius up to 400 Celsius and get some EELS data and see what's going on. So what they did was uh, essentially um, define an area that they want to scan over. So essentially you wouldn't be able to do these experiments at the same time. What they did is they repeated this heating cycle. So once or more for the PTO layer, once or more for the STO layer. So we're just basically continuously scanning in one of these layers and then getting a time series of EELS data. So in this kind of experiment, what they found was they didn't have any um, Elner's variation in the STO, which is kind of what you'd expect, but they saw some interesting kind of modular or modulated changes in the crystal field peak kind of intensity in the LT3 for the, for the lead titanate layer. So that's kind of like a one, one way of doing an experiment. So another way, if you're um, not really worried about damage or anything, so this is something I did with tin nanoparticles, so another heating experiment. So essentially what we do is, what we can do is we can melt these tin nanoparticles and we get a plasmon shift from the liquid to the solid phase. So this guy isn't beam sensitive at all, so I'm, I've just been kind of fairly easy here. I just part the beam on one of these tin nanoparticles and then run a heating experiment. So this was using the hybrid pixel camera uh, at 9,000 spectra per second. Basically, I start my EELS view running and then I'm choosing some temperature ramp parameters over here. I think the ramp time is like two minutes or so from room temperature up to 300 C. And then I just hit record and then I get my time series. And if you look at that um, peak there, at some point it like abruptly shifts uh, in energy and that shift is associated with the, uh, the melting and recrystallization of that, of that tin nanoparticle. If, if you had some drift, could you like drag the beam manually and still be collecting this picture? With this particular one, this is, with this guy, no. So I've, um, if you wanted to have like some idea of where that particle would be, you'd need to still be scanning. Yeah. So you could do it like, um, like this one, for example, as this, so what, what they did here, like I've only shown the EELS data, but they would be, they have like a live stem image of this area that you would see as the experiment's progressing. So you would be able to move, you'd be able to move the sample if you wanted to. If you want to do like actually an active drift correction, a spe spectrum imaging is the way that you would, you would do that. But the, the advantage of doing like, doing it like this is like simpler. Um, and the major advantage is the time resolution is going to be higher in, in S. Well, the time resolution is not strictly higher, but if you kind of do a spectrum image, you don't really want to have the, the thing changing within the spectrum image if possible. So a time series of EELs is just inherently faster because you're just doing like ind individual spectra. So you get the full frame rate of the, cam the camera rather than having to do a whole spectrum image frame, which is, you, you probably couldn't get the whole spectrum image frame like faster than about two seconds unless you seriously compromise the spatial resolution. But it, there's kind of different kind of paths to set the thing up. And it's like, this is probably a good way of having, basically you're going to have, an average spectrum or sum from a given area, and you'd have a stem image at the same time. So it depends what's the, the what's the goal, I think. But yeah, so you can track it spatially, like if you scan this, not at all, because that image is not live. Right, right. And then the other option is spectrum imaging, which I think I'll show on the next slide. So so yeah, so all right, so that was an EELS example. Spectrum image example. So this is again, very similar. So we just enable in situ mode in this in situ palette. 
and then set the spectrum image up in exactly the same way that we would normally. So we choose our scan area, we choose our timing, um, choose our spectrum image signals, whether we want EELs, EDS, seabeds, kind of set the detector up. So this the example in this screenshot is for a 40 stem spectrum image. Uh, there's a wildfire plugin that was licensed for this screenshot as well. So we have a wildfire uh, palette down here. And then it's a heating experiment, so you can you can kind of set that up down there. One of the nice things in particular um, with digital micrograph or the continuum is we can do multimodal spectrum imaging. So yeah, so you can get like multiple data streams as part of the same acquisition. So EDS, EELs, like if we had a CL spectrometer, we could do that. And we could do 4D stem, which is the diffraction signal. And it's all done within this kind of palette that we're kind of familiar with. So stem spectrum imaging, 2D array, multi-point line scan. And then we just choose our signal here at the top. So the example in the screenshot, multimodal, so it's EELs plus EDS. So generally doing a e multimodal with EDS and EELs or 40 stem and EELs is pretty easy because the EDS signal doesn't interfere with either of the other two because it's because of the detector geometry. It's like surrounding the, surrounding the sample. It doesn't block the EEL signal in any way. So next example. So this is a heating experiment. So this, this is the same sample that we were using in the demonstration downstairs. So I've written it as hydrated iron oxide, but there's, that's open to debate. It's actually an iron C hydroxide. Um, so what is it? Okay, so this is a heating experiment. What we're doing downstairs is a, is a gas experiment, but it's kind of similar. We heat this up in vacuum and it's gonna reduce. So it's primarily three plus oxidation state at the beginning of the experiment. And then as we heat it up, it becomes two plus. So it's multimodal. So I'm acquiring dual eels with the K3. So we have a low loss spectrum image there on the left, high loss in the middle, and then there's an EDS spectrum image that's being acquired. So the example I'm showing here uses a neat feature. It's using a new continuous scanning mode with the DigiScan 3, high, hardware synchronized sub-scanning. So if you look at the spatial resolution in that ADF image, it's much higher than the analytical signals over here by a factor of eight. And then we're doing continuous drift correction as well. So this, these features all combined are like super useful for an in-situ experiment. This, this goes out of focus by like eight microns over this temperature range. And it also drifts by probably 50% or more of the field of view if we don't have drift correction on. So speed it up. Um, I talked a bit too long there. So what we're also doing is live quantification. So Oxygen, just using a Hartree Slater cross section shape. Two references for iron, so a two plus reference and a three plus reference. And you can see down in this pie chart, it's giving us live quantification results from that uh, oxide uh, heating. Majority three plus at the beginning. You see the drift tracking um, is very, very good. So we don't have to worry about the spatial drift. And then I'm manually refocusing this as the experiment goes on. You can see that we form voids in these oxide particles as it gets to higher and higher temperature. We start to form some iron two. And yeah, so I think getting there, so about 600 Celsius now. I heated this up to about 850 Celsius. And then, so yeah, we're getting more and more two plus oxidation state iron. And then right at the end, this starts to change like morphology like significantly. And at some point, oof, it changes, it looks like I heated it too much. And we have formed some metal um, nanoparticles. So this is saying that we have like two plus. So I think that's probably not true in, for this frame. It's likely just that the two plus uh, reference just is, is a closer match to the metal. So if we had three references, I would suspect that we'd get metal for this end kind of state. So that's, um, okay, so that's in situ spectrum imaging, multimodal, EELs and EDS. So what if we wanted to do 40 stem and EELs? Okay, so that's not something we can do simultaneously. 
So I did this a while ago. So um, yeah, because we kind of had the question, we did this experiment once and it's like, oh, okay, we, we see the oxidation state changing. It would be nice to have some diffraction information. So this experiment was done um, manually with a heating holder, essentially some commercial copper oxide powder, heat it up again, done the same thing, 27 Celsius up to 600 Celsius. And you see like massive changes in morphology uh, and we get microstructural crystallographic and chemical changes like all at the same time. So kind of the important thing here is this, this is not uh, reversible, right? So if we wanna have like this information, as we go through this in situ experiment, we need to kind of get it as you go. So the first time I did this, I just did it manually. So it's, it's very easy to do a manual multimodal experiment. You just get an eel spectrum image. You go over to the filter, like kind of little button on the microscope UI, you change the F10 and you just capture another spectrum image. So you just get a 40 stem data set immediately after the eels data set. So if you do it once, it's quite easy, but when you're doing a, an in situ experiment, you need to have quite a lot of those. And so if you do it, do this whole thing manually, like real, the real limitation is that it takes a lot of time to do that. So when I did this experiment the first time, I found that basically I had some data here at 350 Celsius, and then the next one of 400 Celsius, huge change. So it's like what's happened in between 350 Celsius and 400 Celsius. So this manual experiment, I think there were like six steps separated by about 50 Celsius or something. Yeah, so it's like, how do we kind of get beyond that? How do we improve the stimulus resolution while keeping the experiment practical? So a much better approach is to use scripting and automate that experiment. So you can do all of this with DM script and probably Python in the future. So this is all done programmatically. And essentially I redesigned this experiment. Well, it's basically the same experiment, just done automated. So what do we do? We go round and round this loop. So um, you can control the wildfire holder so we can set the temperature, perform a spatial drift correction, fire in eels and an EDS spectrum image at the same time, save that to disk, change the filter mode, get a 40 stem, get the EDS again, because we get it for free. You can then add the two EDS spectrum images together at the end and increase the signal. Change back to eels, set the temperature, so increment the temperature, and then just go around and around this loop, okay? So it's just automated. How does that compare to the original experiment? So the original experiment, I had a temperature resolution of 50 Celsius. My automated experiment, I went down to two Celsius. 10 data points for my manual experiment, 220 temperature points for my automated experiment. 20 spectrum images for the manual, you kind of see the trend, right? So then I'm nearly at 900 spectrum images for my automated experiment. Uh, this manual experiment took like more than six hours of my time to run. And then the automated experiment in terms of my time, <laughs> less than an hour, because I just kind of set the thing up, run the script, and then this ran overnight. We ran it for like hours and hours. Uh, I think probably six, eight hours or so. Probably could be optimized a bit, but you know, we're using the microscope in a kind of a time slot where it's not gonna be used. And then in terms of like user time, it's like way, way more efficient. So massive improvement in temperature resolution and a massive improvement in productivity. So, okay, so what was the results with this guy? So this, this was all done with K3 detector. So we've got uh, this kind of matrix of data. So imaging data from the ADF detector, this MSM kind of thing there, that's maximum spot maps. So that's just some like pseudo orientation maps that were generated using a Python script that my colleague Ben wrote. And so this is essentially processed 4D stem data. And then we've got copper, like fine structure mapping, oxygen fine structure mapping, and then zirconium and so forth. And then if you go from left to right, these are essentially just different temperature bands. I've summed uh, like 40 Celsius temperature kind of chunks, mainly so it fit on the slide because the, um, yeah, and to boost the signal to noise ratio. 
So you get, yeah, there's like a lot of information here. So we're using the K3 at this very low dispersion. So we have big energy range, but we have enough energy uh, resolution to do this fine structure mapping. So the blue here is uh, copper two, red is copper one, and green is copper zero. So we get the reduction as we would expect because we're heating in vacuum. Oxygen fine structure mapping here. So I'm just looking at two fingerprints. One is the copper oxide fingerprint and the other is silica because I have this weird chunky particle there. And we get this kind of copper two fingerprint, the copper two oxide fingerprint disappears as we expect. What was kind of fun with this experiment in particular um, is there's like a whole bunch of stuff that shouldn't really be there. So we, we found like, oh, look, we've got some zirconium. We're able to kind of map that out. We look further at stuff that didn't even fit on that slide. We also have uh, titanium, we have iron. So this is where it's really, really nice to have the eels and the EDS signal. So we have something that which we think is copper oxide. We also have like a whole bunch of other elements that shouldn't be there um, that we see in the eels. So it's like, okay, do we believe that? Is it an artifact? Is it real? The fact that we have these complementary signals gives us kind of, you know, trust in this data because we can get a titanium L map from the eels and we can get a titanium K map from the EDS. So these are independent results that show us the same thing. And the same with like iron. So we had L of iron in our eels and K for iron in the EDS. So yeah, I guess kind of the take home message is like, you know, you don't always know what the answer is going to be. And like having all this information is, is quite useful. So having this low dispersion eels gives you this big field of view. You see things that you would otherwise miss. Having the EDS is also going to help. And then with this kind of in situ experiment in particular, you really have to get all of the data as you kind of go along because it's non-reversible. You can only do it once. And this is a really you know, kind of powerful way to do that. Okay, so... That is the final slide. So just to summarize, um, in situ data is critical to capture the full story of material transformations from start to finish. If we just do a before and after kind of measurement, it's often gonna be insufficient for us to draw accurate conclusions. Uh, counting detectors are very, very optimal for any in situ data capture due to their high speed and high sensitivity and near zero readout noise uh, over sampling in a temporal domain. So actually the, just kind of on that point, like these guys where we're summing 40 Celsius range here, if I was to do like a two Celsius range and do the EELS maps, they would not be like high enough SNR, like high enough data quality to do this fine structure mapping. Like this is actually, this experiment was super optimized for 40 stems. So we had a low convergence angle and we're, paying a serious signal penalty in the EELS experiment by doing that. But because you can just sum the data after the fact, you can kind of make some like temperature resolution sacrifice here and we can kind of get around that kind of signal hit that we paid. So, a bit of a tangent, but yeah. So yeah, the count counting detectors are really gonna help you there because it's fast and low noise. And then being able to do this all in a single experiment in the single kind of hardware is really quite convenient because you can just, you're getting confident that you're getting the data from the same area at the same pixel resolution and, and so forth. So yeah, uh, thanks for listening and oh. Um, it's just done on the same camera, yeah. Yeah, but then we use That was all K3 data, but you can get 4D stem on any of those filter cameras. So you can get 4D stem on the fiber couple camera, the Stellar, or the K3. Like the, um, there's some, there's some, yeah, basically the, the kind of perform, the, there will be different, right? Different results, different, the results are going to be the same, but like the way you set the experiment up might be slightly different. So, because we basically have a camera that's in the same position. So your 
if you compare the hybrid pixel, well, compare the hybrid pixel versus the K3 is probably the easiest example. So your hybrid pixel is going to be much bigger uh, pixels, right? So your angular resolution at the same like uh, camera length is going to be worse uh, because it's more pixelated. But the dynamic range of that detector is like higher, and the frame rate's higher. So the if you do the fastest readout of the hybrid pixel, it's something like 18,000 pixels per second. And I think the K3 is more like 3,000. Probably going to be using enough signal to use so high. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's always a consideration. Yeah. So if you're going at like 20,000 20, frames per second, you have still a finite number of electrons that you're going to get on those frames. So, it, but it depends. You, you can sum them up, right? So you can do the multipass with 40 stem just as you can with eels. And you probably will have good signal in the stem image going at that speed. And so, yeah, you can, going fast is always going to be good for like reducing, it, reducing the damage because you're not parked somewhere, drift correction, like spreading out contamination. But ultimately you're right, you do need to have a measurable amount of signal you just either have a massive probe current or you have a lower probe current and then just accumulate for longer. But you can continuously scan and build it up as a time series that you don't put them collapse afterwards. No problem. I think that's the automatic that was focused. Yeah. Mm. You just have a one focus option it starts getting a bit blurry, uh -huh. which automatically says, I'll move this frame on a little bit, yeah. this frame, and that doesn't work, next frame goes back the other way. Yeah. Just find an option. Yeah. I, I, uh, I have an open request for, uh, for yeah. autofocus. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely... Yeah, it's, it's definitely, like... It's really like for it's 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 kind of key, I think, for these kind of experiments. So this one, um, uh, no, that's dynamic. So that's why you have to do it. This is auto focusing the flight tape all through. Whoops. You're already taking on the features. Variable focus. If you didn't variable focus, you wouldn't know the difference. But how would you? I'm not sure if that's running. So this one, um, what are you going to say? So in terms of your the drift correction, so this one actually works pretty well with the drift correction. It's like, and I think the at the kind of the during the experiment, you just want the drift correction to be good enough that it doesn't go out the field of view, and then you can post correct afterwards and do a fi a refinement, and then yeah, focusing this by hand is super annoying. So this, it's like. I have to sit there for half an hour. We did quite a, not a big temperature range. Well, it's a fast ramp rate on this one. For the other experiment, impossible. So I was, we left it running for like 12 hours. You can't sit there for 12 hours focusing every minute. It's, yeah, it's definitely, especially when you're at high temperature range. I think with these chips, we don't really see any bending until maybe 600 Celsius. But then between six and like above 600, it's, it changes significantly. And it's, yeah, I'd I really love to see a autofocus feature. Um, oh yeah, the other one's a small converter angle. I think it's, it's gonna be like four, maybe two, three. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's mm. mm -hmm. If you've got a sample on a substrate, is a let's say for example, see the membrane. Mm -hmm. If you make it, it turns to a small hole. Mm -hmm. Can you just when you do the image, you can analyze like have a script to analyze? Uh, you could. You could, if you, yeah, you could put, um, 
if you have so, so you, you could actually design an auto an autofocus script um because we have like stuff um like functionality for, it's called like an image listener so there's like events that get pushed when the image ends mm -hmm. so you could have an event-based script that would do that kind of thing um so at a certain points you so you could do it on like a marker like you suggest mm -hmm. um that's probably quite a reasonable idea because it wouldn't change like the like the you know, if we're heating that thing, it's changing. So what's the measure? But then, and doing it in this, yeah, doing it in a script would, would be feasible. It would be more complicated scripting, but it would definitely be possible because you could just get images, send them to the focus routine. And we, yeah, so we can do that kind of analysis and we have access to the, the focus control of the microscope. So you have all the, essentially all the, all the knobs that you need in, in script exist, just makes, the script needs to be written by someone. I did actually find a script, but it was all in MATLAB, which is uh, outside my area of expertise. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, so for this, uh, it needs wildfire integration, right? So could you make us uh, hold it agnostic? So this actually, this is done with a wildfire plugin, but I have another thing that works with Impulse. It's purely Python. Because okay. with, I mean, this would be great for gas as well. Like yeah. We have the older holder. Mm -hmm. You could just set a delay time or something. Yeah. And then that matches your RAM frame. Yeah. 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 Is yeah. this on the scripts library? Uh, it's not? very hard to try and set a recipe and synchronize it with the spectrum image. Like okay. that's actually quite difficult because it has like kind of it, when you start the experiment, okay. it uh, essentially it programs it basically starts a camera running starts to, there's a lot of things that happen at the beginning that don't necessarily always take the same amount of time so that like fernando's tried to do that before by, by kind of doing a ramp at yeah. the end of a frame or something and it very rapidly got out of sync okay what maybe you, hmm? well, i was just gonna say maybe when we install we can yeah yeah so so yeah this this is a super easy example with the wildfire because we have a we have a we have a plugin for it yeah. so there's literally a function call where you say like set temperature right. and get temperature there's i've done something more recently with a heating biasing holder so it's still a dens holder we don't have a plugin for that holder but dens do have a python api for their impulse software which you can run in in the Python script and digital micrograph. And you can do it by the same mechanics. So I'm basically having something where at, at the end of the frame, it tells the holder to do something. So it's either like set up you know, increment bias, increment temperature. Then, so essentially like if there was any, yeah, it depends if there's an API for whatever holder you're trying to work with or not. And it's going to be vendor specific. So yeah. It's, yeah, it would be specific. I mean, I like kind of the worst case scenario. Maybe you could get like a little controller or something to interface with hardware. Yeah. And then, you know, like a little Arduino or whatever. But it's, it's easiest to start that kind of, is there an API that exists already? Like work with that. And I mean, you've... When it's all synchronized, it works much better. So if you're like, you, you have a regular kind of timing event that happens and it tells the thing to do something at a specific time, but you could probably, you maybe could design in just fixed times, but I think you have to be more. I mean, you could do like fixed time and run it and then you get the data that you get across yeah. your like, whatever your stimulus is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. This, yeah, there's definitely this different paths to, doing the same thing but i think for spectrum imaging this like this method of telling the holder to do something when you are like not getting data is is quite beneficial because otherwise you've got a ramp that's happening and you're it, you essentially like the longer that spectrum image takes to require the shallower the ramp needs to be yeah, for right, you not right. to have like pixel one to pixel like n completely different stimulus conditions. Yeah. yeah, so for the heating experiment that I showed, like we're going, um, 
we're going like really fast here. This only takes a few seconds to apply, acquire that data, but we're only like 32 by 62 pixels in the yields. So the subscanning kind of gets us around this because we multiply our image pixel. We have eight times as many image pixels, but if we wanted high resolution in the eels data, we would have to increase this number. And then this number is going to go up. Um, so you can have a massive probe current. And then, so if you're going ultra fast, you have enough signal in those spectra, but there's certain things, you know, if you have something that's beam sensitive, that's not something you'd want to do. Right. So, but there's, yeah, there's definitely different, um, different kind of ways to get the data and there's different compromises associated with each path. I like the scripting method, but I'm biased because I designed it. <laughs> So. Okay, all right. Yeah. Okay. Oh. One last one, and then we will. Um, so I'm guessing that we get uh, huge pipes of this. Um, this one is not very big. This one's 35 gigabytes. Uh, which, oh, oh, no. <laughs> so compared to the. Uh, so this one, uh, this one was surprisingly 135 gigabytes, it's only eels, because it's got, I don't, I don't think I did the math, so, because it's doing 9,000 spectra per second and then run it for a few minutes, that adds up quite quick. So this one's 135 gigabytes, this one was 35, and then the one at the end, this one's nearly a terabyte of data, I think it's 800 gigabytes. Mainly it's the 4D stem that's, that's, that's hitting us with this one, because so each of those 4D stem uh, data sets is probably is like going to be 10 gigabytes each and we've got 200 of them something like that but yeah this this data set's a big a big data set yeah so the um i kind of can show you the eels later um so these so the way that the in situ works is it's all streamed to hard disk it's not in system memory so it will load like a chunk of that data into memory buffer. So it doesn't have to be able to load that terabyte of data all at the same time. It's just gonna um, load some of it. You can sum in time and do it on the fly, but the more, the bigger the sum is gonna get, the, the more of a performance hit on the computer it's gonna take. Uh, the eel, like the eels is, is quite snappy. The 40 stem you have to be a bit careful with, but it's gonna all the process, the processing tools have kind of been extended to have like time uh, domain to them now. So generally, like if you do mapping or non-linearly squares fitting or anything like that, you run it on time series data. The software says, do you want to run this on the whole series or just what's displayed? So it, the workflow is not dissimilar to normal kind of data processing in the software. The one thing to bear in mind, you really want to have the, have the data on a solid state drive, not a spinning drive. So the, the, the acts, yeah, the acts, the, it just needs to have like fast um, access to the data. Um, I started off, I think the first time I tried to process one of these, it was like on a USB three, like spinning drive. And it was, uh, wasn't very quick. <laughs> so, and then the drive would like, would hot would rest and then you could hear it like kind of start up every single time I made any changes. But once if it's on a solid state drive, it's quite um it's quite responsive. But don't try and sum like a hundred gigabytes of stuff and expect it to take like a split second. It's yeah, and that, that's kind of a good question. Just kind of like we kind of said with accounting detector. If you don't know the time resolution you need, you can kind of oversample so you can go a bit faster. That doesn't necessarily mean you should always go at the most crazy fast speed possible because you, you'll, you'll get like a lot of data and then you have a data management issue. Um, like you'll possibly be able to process it in the software, but just like moving it around. If you have something that's 10 gigabytes, it's quite easy. If you have something that's like two terabytes, it's less easy. So if you think something's going to happen every 60 seconds, don't sample it at like 9,000 spectra per second, sample it at like, you know, tens of seconds or, or something that's sen sensible. It's, it's, easy, it's an easy kind of trap to fall into and you end up with just 
loads of data that you're never going to do anything with or have time to, to look at. Yeah.
Right, our next speaker will be John Watt again.